Давайте проверим. Об уху Вадим Сергеевич, есть Маскевич Яна Георгиевна, есть и Федотов Дмитрий Леонидович. Есть, отлично. Алексей Павлович, тогда полный список ребят вступающих. Так, какая еще формальность? Давайте от греха проверим переводы. Соответственно, сейчас говорю я просто на русском, и у меня вопрос к нашим иностранным участникам, идет ли у них перевод. Слышите на английском, да? Okay, let's change. I will speak in Russian, and so my... А сейчас я говорю по русски, по английски. Есть какой язык вы слушаете? Maybe you will choose the channel. Change the channel. Что? Пошел на русский, да? Окей, okay, so we haven't any problems. И, и... уважаемые члены комиссии, вы тоже слышите, да, с, с английского на русский. Так. Вроде все. Так, тогда передаю слово председателю нашего экспертного комитета, нашего жюри, Алексею Павловичу Козыреву, декану философского факультета Московского государственного университета. Алексей Павлович. Спасибо. Так, дорогие друзья, 14.01. Время. Да? Четко с вами по графику начинаем. И э, у нас 15 выступающих. Это очень много. Мы с вами должны отработать четко. And we have to work, and we have to follow this schedule. Uh, only 15 minutes given for one presentation. So, if you finish earlier, then there can be some questions or some comments, but you have only 15 minutes. I would ask you to speak not very quickly, because we have simultaneous interpretation into both Russian and into English, because some participants will be talking English. This is an international team here. So I guess that's all the formal questions which I would like to discuss. So now let's move to your presentations and I wish good luck to everyone. I wish success in presenting your projects. We will be very attentive in listening your presentations. You will be watched in different cities, in Moscow and probably abroad. So we have a very responsible events here. So uh, I'd like to give the floor to the first presenter, Berbel Rodriguez Alvaro. Please, the floor is yours. Yeah, it is. I am studying at the University of Granada in Spain, and my presentation will be in English. But first, I would like to thank Baltic Federal University for the invitation to take part in this Olympiad and for beautiful, wonderful work of the organizers. This is going to be a lecture, but I don't want you to listen passively. I want you to reflect on the topics that I'm going to touch upon and so that you can practice in your own life, so that you can apply it to your life. Um, sorry, next one. Oh. Well, uh, this is the index, and uh, I would like to start with an exercise of imagination. Imagine you start playing an online game where avatars have to be either female or male. You're uh, a male person with a male avatar and you meet a female avatar. And little by little, you start getting to know her and you eventually fall in love. What if this female avatar doesn't happen to be a female in real life? This is what philosopher Don Heide studies. Um, he developed a game called Second Life where there were no limitations for communication and these events 
happened. There's two main currents of thought. The first one is the internet. Nothing happens. It's not real life. The other one, real people are behind those screens playing the game. So it's a real problem being lied at. Uh, these dangers of digital reality are touched upon by uh, Esther Lufa and Maria Brinker. First, Esther Lufa explains about the paradox of power and control with digital reality. Every day, more and more, we use uh, digital networks for anything in our life. We need it to get a medical certificate, to join university for anything. And it's quite helpful, but the paradox is, the more control we have over these technologies, the more controlled we are. Every time we are doing something through digital reality, our data is being given to the organizers of every company. And uh, Maria Brinker is specialized in uh, algorithm ethics. She criticizes algorithms that recommend you films, for example, in uh, uh, film apps, because she uh, says that it's a very important part of human nature to choose the content that you're going to watch, depending on what you like or what you would like to learn about. But if you are told what you have to do and what you have to like, we lose our human capacity to choose. Is technology adapted to our needs? Or is it adapted to companies to know more about our data? What can philosophy contribute to this? Uh, there's a different currents of uh, thought in ethics. Uh, normally, it's divided into ontological and theological ethics, as we know. Mm, Kant is specialized in was in the current of uh, ontological thought, and uh, according to him, to him, the, it was your own moral law that dictated uh, ethics. While for Aristotle. It was more about the aim of things and how we got to happiness. What about algorithm ethics? Well, Aníbal Molesterio, a Spanish researcher, studies this, and he explains that we live in a kind of algorithm, uh, algorithm crazy. We are controlled by algorithms. I'm going to give you another uh, imagination exercise to apply it to your own life. Imagine you're working in a company where there's an algorithm that dictates who is fired depending on their productivity. If, there's not, if it's not aim-based, then if you are less productive because you're ill, because you're pregnant or your wife is pregnant, or you have any problem, that won't matter because these algorithms take away our human nature. They take away our culture and what makes us people they don't care about aims. They only care about objective things. They may be controlling where I'm going in a, in a city, for example, but they won't know why. The, this topic of surveillance is studied by Evan Selinger and Judy Ree in their normalizing surveillance paper. Surveillance is getting more normal with the time. It's getting even desirable. People argument that thanks to surveillance, we're going to be safer. But isn't it the opposite? Who is going to save us from that surveillance? Who is going to let you have the freedom? Now I'm going to move to uh, human dynamics. I wanted to be able to apply uh, this philosophy in your own lives. So I decided that the things that move us uh, more in life are love and hatred or violence. Of course, we're not in one side or the other or the spectrum. We move around it throughout the day. So, uh, James Clark is one of the first philosophers to study uh, infidelity online. Um, to me, it was very interesting to study about this topic because um, actually in digital reality, the borders of morality are continually being faded. Why? We're completely anonymous when we're online. Uh, nobody's going to know it's us unless we say it. 
and we can form our own personality through this digital reality, a whole new personality. So sometimes when we interact with people, we can uh, avoid the fact that we have a partner, for example, and this anonymity takes away our responsibility sometimes. We don't feel that we're doing harm to people. Is our personality online the same as our personality offline? Catherine Hartline doesn't see everything as black or white. As I said before, there's a spectrum. Of course, digital reality has many advantages. For example, in relationships, they help bring together couples who are living in a long, rela in a long relationship, uh, who are far away from each other. But this also has a price. When you're video calling with someone, the visual contact is very poor. I don't know if, you have, if it has happened to you, but when talking to someone online, some, sometimes you get angry at them or they get angry at us you because of misunderstandings. We need to look at each other personally. We need that visual contact. Also, that anonymity I was talking about before causes deceit. It takes the responsibility away from us. So we think that uh, cheating on a person is completely fine. Um, moreover, technology may cause distraction. When we are talking to someone online, we might be cooking, doing something else, or even looking at social media, and we don't pay them the attention that they deserve. Or we don't pay attention to our surroundings when talking to someone. Moyano Sanchez uh, and Flores study this uh, more deeply, especially in Facebook-based uh, social media. They studied that infidelity online has the same effects as infidelity of offline. Feelings of humiliation, low self-esteem, anger, and even psychological problems like PTSD or depression. Now, what do you think? Does it, does the thing, do the things that you do online have a real effect in real life? The answer is yes. Uh, actually, one third of the divorce uh, reports in many countries are caused by these social media. Davies gives a, a cognitive approach to infidelity online, and he discovered, and I agree quite a lot with him, that things that um, make you do, make you cheat online, those factors are the same as offline factors. And these same factors, such as impulsivity, quick satisfaction or intensity also empower criminal acts on the internet. They also empower um, things that should be covered by law. But there's a problem. Digital reality is something very new and law hasn't still had any time to study this and to put it on paper. So many people might do criminal activity online, yet not being convicted with any crime. Anonymity also causes recklessness. We are prone to, uh, to get in evil when, whenever we are not watched by some reason. That's the nature of human being. The human being is naturally prone to corruption. Uh, Bielayak uh, also thinks that online and offline violence is completely direct uh, have completely direct uh, consequences. Uh, he also speaks about the lack of uh, regulation, uh, since I just said. Uh, and in many countries, people may, might be bullied online, or people uh, might commit some very serious crimes uh, online without uh, being caught. A very uh, sad example that touches me very closely is the death of uh, Inui Singer um, and two years ago. Her name was Kelly Fraser. After all the pressure she had online, after all that cyberbullying, she ended up committing suicide. That was a very hard piece of news for her fans and family, and it's a clear uh, show that, off, that online violence has a very important effect on uh, online reality. Did you know that 8% of students are bullied online? 
and 12% are bullied uh, offline. Well, these two uh, online or offline uh, bullying have uh, a lot of uh, a very good connection. When you see your bully every day at school, it gets more and more difficult um, to report your situation. When that bully follows you home every time that you join uh, the digital reality. Why? Because we are addicted to it. Even if we suffer through it, we cannot get rid of it. And this gets even worse with women. Racial slurs, um, slurs about the body are always, in most cultures, mostly directed to women. And this is an exception for online violence. Women are constantly being blackmailed and they suffer extortion in this digital reality, which affects their private life every day. And they also feel guilty about it. They feel that they are the one to blame. Because? Because they're the one, they're the one going on this digital reality, on these social media. But the problem is the aggressor, isn't it? Finally, Tommaso Bertolotti and Lorenzo Magnani say that this um, cyberbullying should be a social alarm. Internet empowers cyberbullying. Usually, empower is used with a positive connotation. But uh, in this case, uh, the consequences are completely terrible for academic, professional, or personal fields. People might be fired because of uh, some content being uh, filtered online. People might start to be bullied at school and academic uh, spaces because of this uh, cyberbullying. So it's not something we should overlook. What conclusion can we get to? Well, I think uh, we all might have a similar point in this, in this issue. And it is that with a great power, comes a great responsibility. It's in our hands to use digital reality in an ethical, moral way. But it's also in our hands to create our own moral law for this digital space. Let's not be easily corrupted by this. Let's act online in the same way that we act offline. Because as you have seen, this has either terrible or great consequences. This was Ethics in Data Reality, Alvaro Verbel. And thank you so much for your attention. Spasiva Samnimania. Gracias por su atención. Here's uh, the references if you need uh, a further explanation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Dear colleague, so you have not run out of time. So we keep on moving forward. Our next uh, presenter is Abbas Jong. Hello, everyone, and uh, uh, hello, dear member of the jury. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the organizer of this event. Uh, holding an international Olympiad on philosophy is highly uh, commendable in the current global situation. Uh, my name is Abbas Zhuang. I'm a PhD candidate in sociology at Humboldt University of Berlin. Um, I studied philosophy and uh, sociology. In sociology. Um, and it is two years that I've been working on Russian philosophy, and for the first time I translated four volumes on Russian philosophy into Persian. Um, no, right now I'm trying to prepare the, uh, uh, to conduct a kind of comparative study between Russian philosophy and Iranian philosophy. And uh, what I'm trying to present today is a part of this comprehensive project. And uh, please forgive me if uh, the proposed uh, arguments are complicated and a, a little bit long. Due to, due, due, to, uh, due to the time limit, I will mention only some parts of it. In short, in my presentation, I aim to illustrate the relationship between philosophy and contemporary crisis on the global scale. 
I want to show how, by formulating a kind of cosmopolitan philosophy based on Semyon Frank's ontologism and ju uh, juxtapositing it with the Henry Corbin comparative philosophy and the notion of intuition, and also phenomenological her uh, uh, hermeneutic, and also uh, by incorporating Martin Heidegger and, own and owning philosophy, a Reignis philosophy, it is possible to conduct a kind of uh, cosmopolitan philosophy, a philosophy that aims to examine the fundam fundamental and grounding question and principles of nature, humanity, and human civilization, a philosophy that has almost lost its authentic effectiveness and leading role since the advent of modernity. I consider a special reading of comparative philosophy as the most effective and consistent method for realization of cosmopolitan philosophy. More specifically, in my presentation, I will elaborate on the Im uh, ontological implication of Semyon Frank's philosophy for cosmopolitan philosophy and comparative philosophy by addressing two, do two uh, dominant antinomies in this field of study, namely singularity, universality, and historicity, and a historicity. Um, now I will start my presentation, if you want to take German sociologist Orlich Beck began his last book with the following question, why do we no longer understand the world? And based on these, we can raise the question, why we as individual communities and nations, and even as philosophers, can no longer easily locate ourselves and others in the existing local and national and global, uh, global horizons? Similarly, we cannot uh, simply distinguish good from bad, right from wrong, value from worthlessness, morality from immorality, virtue from non-virtue, and generally good life from bad life. It seems that we humans have lost the solid foundation and sound standards on which we have built different civilization over centuries. What we humans who claim to have reached the highest level of knowledge and progress have lost the simple guideline for happy loss and virtuous life. At the beginning of the third decade of the 21st century, we have almost experienced various forms of modernity and modernization in our lives. Today, we can confidently assert that we live in a completely modern era, alongside with its new faces in the form of various post or alternative modernity, an era whose philosophical foundations were formulated around 500 years ago with a break from a classical and medieval philosophy in Western Europe. But just, just as we, we were celebrating conquering nature by killing gods and tradition, and just as we were enamored with modernity's achievement, we were confronted with the unintended side effect and unexpected consequences of modernity and modernization. The dominance of formal rationality in the post machiavellian sense collective reason in the sense of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and finally, the will to power in Nietzsche's sense had promised to settle human beings in the worldly utopias. But what they exactly generate were political, cultural, economic, and environmental crises that now threaten the existence of civilization on a global scale. The emergence of secular and colonial nation state, which were accompanied by many of internal and external purges, conflict and massacres, various regional and global wars, and then environmental crisis, global revolution, global financial crisis, unbridled expansion of tech technology, mass migration, terrorism, nuclear incidents, environmental pollution, the emergence of mass movement, the replacement of political and intellectual elites with uh, uh, mass celebrities, various kinds of pandemics and bi biological crises, and etc all can be considered part of the process and also consequences of the last three centuries of modernity, which was able to conquer the whole world by being displaced from his historical home, namely Western Europe. As Ulrich Beck argues, right now, we don't live in a modern society promised with a positive and progressive future, but in a risk society with many dangers and threats, which in which, which is generated precisely by, by our attempt to build modern utopias. 
due to, due to the contra contraction of a time and a space in the late modernity, these crises have now taken on a global form are, and are transforming the human geogra geography on the world at the accelerating speed. No, our individual as well as social life in all parts of the world are inescapably intertwined. The main conflict in the current world is not conflict over collecting and accumulating goods such as the wills and capital, but the conflict over avoiding and escaping from bads like dangers and risk. Most, uh, most importantly, the increasingly role of environmental crisis, along with the, the, the constructive and global spread of neoliberalism, have exposed the world to a kind of metamorphosis, a transformation in which fluidity, uncertainty, and indeterminacy are its main outcomes. This process, which can call, be, which can call uh, the cosmopolitanization of the world, is transforming the fundamental achievement of civilization all around the world. But the worn out and fragmented modern intellect on one hand and current world regime of power on the other hand neither can nor have the will to comprehend this crisis and adopt a correct and uh, uh, coherent response to it. The first step in facing this crisis is to identify the nature and roots as a Nietzsche tried to do, or in other words, their genealogy. From a philosophical perspective, a kind of intellectual crisis can be discerned as a basis for the emergence of this crisis. As, in, as a many philosophers have argued for, modern reason emerged from a crisis of classic philosophy and rationality in Middle Ages. Criticism of this totalitarian rationality themselves exaggerate this crisis. As Nietzsche and also Leo Strauss emphasized, the historicist critic of enlightenment and reason which themselves escalate the crisis set the and set the stage for various kinds of relativism and nihilism in the contemporary world. All kinds of historicist and uh, relativist approaches and in the contemporary era various kinds of postmodern, postcolonial philosophies, cultural, intercultural studies and etc. And the reaction formed against them through currents such as a reactionary nationalism extreme right and left, different kinds of Islamism, different identitarian currents, cultural exceptionalists, and etc., are manifestation of this intellectual and identity crisis in the contemporary world. Yes, it seems that we no longer have a reference base to stand and look at human civilization. In the nihilism of an open society, no value or no foundation is superior to any other foundation. Everything is good, equal, and respectable. In this regard, it can be concluded that the, the intellectual crisis in the contemporary world requires an intellectual and philosophical confrontation. Although in different intellectual fields, various thinkers and philosophers have been looking for solution or alternative outside of philosophy, but considering the comprehensiveness of this crisis, like ancient Greek philosopher, we need a philosophical, comprehensive, and nature-oriented encounter in order to make sense and then make judgment about this crisis. In this conception, philosophy is viewed metaphorically as ascending from the cave or world of opinion to the light and sun, which is to say to, to, to the true and knowledge. In the first place, we need to reconfirm the philosophical supremacy or the life that sees the search for the wisdom as the best in the greatest good. Then this standpoint requires to join with the virtue of moderation or with need for political community, with civic responsibility, with well-ordered and well-measured thinking and writing. This is a philosophical and intellectual position that concerns and grapples with fundamental and grounding Question and issues of human being, issues such as individual and social life, civilization, social duty, virtue, justice, and etc. By identifying the function and role of classic, classical philosophy, and especially by referring to, to its non-Western reading, along with the revisiting of philosophy in relation to the process of cosmopolitanization of the world, 
as well as drawing on a kind of comparative philosophy that can transcend different intellectual and cultural constructs of different civilizations and translate them into the language of philosophy. And by transcending the dominant category in contemporary philosophy, it is possible to reach a kind of cosmopolitan philosophy, a philosophy that principally deals with the external existence and fundamental principle of human civilization based on the premise of the unity of the world. After that, in this way, philosophy can make value judgments to provide alternative and solution. So in the first step, we need to revisit crit and criticize current philosophies and in, in order to reconstruct a cosmopolitan philosophy. So it's, uh, it is my main question. But under the contemporary goal configuration, what are the conditions of possibility for constructing a cosmopolitan philosophy that can include and incorporate different philosophies as well as intellectual and cultural constructs in a meaningful way into a universal and transhistorical philosophy while suspending and transcending the individual and historical characteristic of that constructs. In this respect, two antinomies had been adversed in comparative philosophy. And at, high, at the high level, they have been the philosophical condition of possibility of a cosmopolitan philosophy. These antinomies are antinomies of universality, singularity, and historicity, and non or a historicity. Antinomies that somehow deal with the problem of plurality and unity in philosophy. The way of touching of this, uh, on these two antinomies at the high level can determine what cosmopolitan philosophy is and how it is possible and works in the current era. As I mentioned, by addressing this antinomy with respect to the idea of cosmopolitanism and drawing on uh, Frank's notion of all unity and his conception of philosophy and introducing the idea of uh, Henry Corbin comparative philosophy, as well as incorporating the idea of and owning by Martin Heidegger a different approach to cosmopolitan philosophy can be presented. According to Semyon Frank, philosophy is scientifically so a substantiated, integral, and whole worldview that deals with the world as a totality and strives to provide unified knowledge of the world. This is exactly the classical conception of philosophy that he tried to present. As a Frank put it, at the beginning of its appearance in the 16th century BC, philosophy fulfilled this, this job well and tried to deal with the universal issues related to the exist, a sense of existence, the nature of human knowledge, and the purpose and meaning of life, issues that were coherently addressed in theoretical and practical philosophy. According to him, gradually the, uni the unity of philosophy from 14th century BC to the 18th century and the emergence of Kant's philosophy were seriously challenged, and it lost its central role in taking into account fundamental and eternal questions related to the world and human existence. In the modern era, and with the emergence of modern, critical, and fragmental intellect, which was supposed to find a solid or absolute foundation for various forms of knowledge based on the immanent reason, we are witnessing the rise of new universalism in philosophical thought which is completely different from classical unified philosophy. But on the other hand, it can be shown that this universalism operates on the basis of a regime of foundationalist differentiation, a regime that criticized and excluded other form of knowledge and intellect, both in the form of, uh, both in the uh, modern West and in the non-Western, non-modern world as a irrational and then unscientific. The religious, the nature, the individual, the mystical, the misorder, the occidental, the non-national, and etc., were rejected as a dis disturbing matter in favor of human comfort and self-preservation. On the other hand, as I note, the critic of this philosophy, which targeted its universal reason, set the ground for the emergence of various types of historicism, culturalism, exceptionalism, and in general, various types of anti- or non-foundationalist or singularism. The, pre the pre predicaments that emerge from the duality of universality and singularity is the dichotomy of foundationalism and non-foundationalism in the construction of truth. In this respect, and based on the extreme historicism and various types of 
non or anti foundationalism since every idea has meaning in a, within a specific time and space comparative philosophy which deal with the uh, com comparison of philosophical and epistemological construct lacks solid criteria for comparing, integrating, and even criticizing philosophical premises and promises. Historicism and non-historicism, which emerged from the critic of immanent reason, were themselves based on the requirement of enlight enlightenment philosophy. There are the basic issue, the basic philosophical issue for building a cosmopolitan philosophy. Um, for Frank, philosophy as an integ integrated worldview has a dual function. On one hand, by examining other separate knowledge, intellectual formation, and scientific systems, philosophy attempts to scrutinize their premises and promises and consider them in relation to each other and simultaneously in relation to the world as well as human life. Based on, uh, but on the other hand, it is a kind of placing and exploring these epistemic construct in relation to the universal and absolute being. Uh, if I want to conclude my, my research on comparative philosophy and cosmopolitan philosophy, I try to incorporate the idea of all unity which offered by Semyon Frank. But he, uh, in contrast to Salaviov, he distinguished between epistemological aspect of all unity and ontological. Ontological is unknowable. We can't reach to the, uh, the being as a whole. But uh, epistemologically, we can somehow find what is the all unity or absolute being. So uh, the absolute for itself, that's absolute for ourselves. Based on that, I try to formulate the kind of cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitan philosophy is a philosophy that try to understand different ep epistemology of the all unity and try to uh, incorporate them, compare them, and construct a global philosophy that deal with the basic question of current civilization. And uh, in this regard, uh, trying to uh, try to consider and incorporate the idea of in intuition, which is his innovation, which is exactly the same for Henry Corbin phenomenology that he used intuition as an important method for comparative philosophy. So this is what I have done in my papers that I Try to present. Sorry, it, 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 it was a little bit long. It was a whole paper. Please forgive me. Thank you. Thank you. Everything was uh, good. And thank you. Uh, so uh, we will try to uh, notify you if uh, you are short of time and if you have got one minute left. And so please uh, try to complete your presentation within one minute. It's kind of it, it's uh, OK, because well, sometimes we lose the track of time. And uh, thank you very much for your most interesting presentation. And we are moving on to the next participant. And uh, uh, excuse me if I pronounce the name incorrectly. Chin Kok Win. Chin Kok Win. Yeah, the floor is yours. К сожалению, мне не слышно спикера, потому что он совершенно не говорит в микрофон. Микрофон где-то внизу. Возьмите, пожалуйста. Переводчики нас должны слышать. Переводчики. Да. Добрый день, уважаемые. Good afternoon. Uh, distinguished colleagues and distinguished jury and participants. Um, my name is Chinku Fuin, uh, so I'm from Vietnam and I'm, I study in Russia and I study the politi political sciences and economics in Eurasia. And today in this Olympiad, uh, I want to make my presentation in Russian and I would like to uh, give you my presentation, uh, which is which is on the ethic problems of digitalization of Vietnamese economy uh, in the current world. So uh, I apologize for my Russian pronunciation. Probably that's not very good, but my Russian is not my na native language. But I will try to do my best. No, uh, so the first, the first stage is the objective of my studies. In my presentation, I wanted to identify 
uh, some ethics, ethical and philosophical aspects of uh, seven uh, po possible models of economic development in Vietnam. And there are three tasks. The first task is to analyze the current publications. And I will show the list of publications at the end of my presentation. The second task is to study the main major models of uh, digital development in Vietnam. And the final task is to identify the ethic principles of the development of such models. So as for the methodology of the research, we need, we as junior researchers, we need to use some tools and methodologies so they can be general uh, academic methodologies, general research method methodologies. So that is uh, analysis, syn synthesis, di dialectical method and systematization, generalization and the systematization. And then we also have to um, carry out the content analysis of publications. And we have to describe uh, the methodology. The end, we also have to uh, make some uh, predictions and forecasts. So the first model, I wanted to mention that the first model, uh, Vietnam has to prove its uh, competitive, uh, com competitive advantage, not only in Eastern Asia, but also on the global scale. And Vietnamese ec economy must, uh, to, must become the global center of innovations and technologies, because such model presupposes very uh, very uh, uh, clearly identified uh, way to competitive advantage, to our competitive advantage. And it means that this model presupposes the Vietnamese economic development to become one of the leaders, one of the digital leaders in the world. And so it also presupposes some ethical checkup uh, of our model, and uh, so that becomes the central uh, the central objective for our government and for the central uh, objective for our global uh, for our national development in the uh, well in the decades in the uh, forthcoming decades. So that means that Vietnam has to become the acknowledged center. Uh, of uh, digital services and information and digital services. Uh, so the competition is a motivator. And very often con competition uh, is uh, the way uh, is the is the way which uh, is to be taken by the current uh, by current Vietnam. Our country must become the center of education and development in uh, IT, and our country has to work out some ethical principles which are connected to new methodologies in education and staff education. So it includes the uh, IT uh, field and the philosophy must become the central background for the for digitalization of the country. So we move on. So this um, model number five is business center. That is the model of the development of Vietnam. Yeah, if uh, my country is going to become the center of formulating the new principles of new philosophical school, uh, it is a quite a realistic scenario of digitalization to small and medium-sized enterprises because it means that the government, the administration, central and the government, uh, central administration must think about the uh, instruments of support to small and medium-sized business in terms of technological development. So uh, this scenario probably is not the most efficient for Vietnam, but it is quite realistic. And that is the only model which uh, 
makes it, which will make it possible to satisfy the domestic demand for IT development, but at the same time, it makes the country dependent on uh, global technologies, and this model uh, must presuppose the ethically correct uh, consumption of uh, IT products and IT services, which will certainly increase the level of IT uh, literacy in the in Vietnamese society. And the last thing which I would like to speak about is that we suggest investment openness of the country for foreign companies. Uh, probably you have thought uh, how foreign companies would invest in Vietnam. And I believe that this work should be done on the basis of concession and uh, taxation privileges for both countries. This model is not preferable for the country. It can be considered only as one of the stages of digitalization. But I also, this way of development of the countries should also be based on principles of balance between uh, national and foreign companies or production. Uh, and without any disbalance in favor of foreign companies. Thus, we can speak, we can say that the seven differences in the model of digitalization of Vietnam uh, suggest that there must be some ethnical principles which are necessary for the development and should be put as the basis of state policy of Vietnam. But in research which has been carried out makes it possible uh, enables us to make the following conclusions, which I'd like to say. According to modern historiography, there is a need to, to work out a unified notion of digital policy, what it is, as well as the notion of digital economy. So far, in scientific literature, there, is, there hasn't been given universal definitions of these notions. Uh, which significantly narrows the theoretical basis of the studying of the problem. And in the and for any country, for Vietnam, for any developing economy, uh, one of the seven models could be chosen for developing of its model of digital future because it's necessary to understand that each of the models of the, of the development of the economy can be applied in certain fields and there should be also, also ethnical principles applied even if some of them are implemented as interim uh, stage but ethnical principles should be in the basis of building of digital economy and scientific and uh, debates in the field of big data, of technology, will undoubtedly continue for many years ahead because digital technologies are continuing to develop and penetrate into every aspect of our current life. And as the research shows, ethics in each model of digital development is the same, uh, is important for both government, uh, business, and must be discussed and served openly. And to make this presentation, I used some resources, uh, some literature, 
including uh, Kant's uh, collection of our university and some other universities, international universities from China, from Vietnam, and I use some documents of our government for development of digital economy of Vietnam. And my presentation, uh, and I'm going to finish my presentation with that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you uh, for being very, very good at timing. Yes, we even have three minutes left if uh, there are any uh, questions. Any, if there are any questions, we are ready to answer. So um, probably the question, uh, well, I will ask the question. You are speaking about the ethic model and you think about the digital ethics and what kind of ethics uh, do you mean? Is it Kantian's ethics? Is it uh, Aristotle ethics? Is it the rational ethics or traditional ethics? Do you mean any particular ethic when you mention the term ethic, or is it the universal set of um, human and uh, global uh, um, concepts of ethic, value, ethical values? Yes, thank you so much for the question. And of course, that's a very good question about ethics, which ethics we need, and what, uh, which one is more applicable. Of course, uh, if, as, as I mentioned in my presentation, we as a developing country, we are learning from other countries and uh, at some moments we use the we use Kantian ethics for developing our digital economy. But in some uh, at some points we have to develop our own oriental ethics. Uh, well, which is based on our mentality, because Vietnam as a country is the country of uh, Southeastern Pacific, uh, South, Southeastern Asia, and we uh, are following the uh, development of ethics in other countries, but uh, uh, well, a lot of my friends uh, and peers who studied in Russia, in they studied in the Soviet Union, and they f go on working as uh, advisors, as counselors for uh, the government of our country, and actually Russian Federation uh, now, uh, well, teaches our uh, people and we uh, go to the universities of Russia and we study philosophy, we study other disciplines, other subjects. And I'm sure that our future generation, the future generation of Vietnam, those who are even younger than me, they will learn what they will need in their future life. And after they have been educated in Russia and other countries, they will come back to, to their country, to our country, and they will develop the ethics, the philosophical ethics in our country. And these ethics will be very applicable to our economy, and they will open the new prospects of our cooperation with other countries, uh, economic cooperation, political cooperation, yeah, so, well, thank you. Переходим к следующему участнику. So we move on, and the next participant is Igor Agapov, and the floor is his. Не спешите. Так, у меня... А, так, у меня еще презентация. So uh, I will set my watch, my stopwatch, and uh, so where is the uh, clicker? So um, I'm going to give you a well popular lecture, and we are going to speak about uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, of course the topic can be rather futurological, uh, but at the same time there are technologies which influence our ethic uh, situations, and there are technologies which are, will be important for us in the future, and we will speak about how we can delegate our moral solutions uh, to the artificial intelligence. 
So, and uh, so the in artificial intelligence is the complex of technological solutions which will imitate the human decision making, uh, will add some particular tasks. So, these uh, the results of such impl such tasks can be comparable to the human decision making. So, what uh, what artificial intelligence can do? Uh, so, uh, in, in terms of es uh, taking ethical dec decisions, first, uh, the artificial intelligence can be used for uh, interviewing people, for hiring people, interviewing people, and it can imitate even the mimics and eye movement. And of course, uh, we have to avoid some transparent technologies and some. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, so when when we um, will conduct the uh, interviews, because uh, we must avoid some um, discrimination in terms of uh, intellect, race, uh, gender, uh, well, ethnic, ethnicity, and so on. So, and artificial intelligence can be used very well here because it is far from discriminating people. And then we also can. Uh, uh, we can prevent crimes, and so this technology uh, to identify to identify the most uh, the, the places of uh, which are prone to criminality, and uh, distributing the uh, uh, police patrols around the city very well. So, just such technology has been tested in the United States, and it is used in Switzerland and Germany, um, and so it analyzes the databases. It analyzes the uh, telephone connections and uh, water pip pipelines and just it uh, well it is used very efficiently in many countries so that that so so that to identify uh, the uh, places which are most pro uh, prone to uh, criminal activities uh, Apart from that, in, in China, uh, they used more data due to machine algorithm, and the system of uh, social crediting uh, is also uh, using the um, artificial intelligence, and it's quite efficient. Then, at the same time, the uh, well, the self-driving or auto autopilot uh, is uh, the technology which is based on artificial intelligence, and it has already been tested in many countries. So, what is so different in ethical problems arising from uh, AI using. So that's difficulty in identifying the liability. So uh, well, the more complex the action is, the more complex, uh, the more difficult it is to identify who's, uh, who's, uh, who, is, uh, the li who is liable for some particular actions. Then, uh, well, low transpar transparency, because um, very often the technologies are in private ownership, and for people it is some kind of black box. Um, uh, but uh, in some in some situations the uh, assumptions are not transparent because we do not know the um, well the original background for the assumptions. So and it's not absolutely accepted and acknowledged conce concept plan for using the artificial intelligence technologies. So then very often uh, the artificial intelligence incorporates uh, some factors which can give some wrong interpretation uh, to, the, to the cases. Andrew Ferguson, who is the leader in this uh, case, me, uh, well, states that sometimes the contracts, uh, well, in the, hiring pro, uh, in the hiring process are concluded very hastily because the artificial intelligence uh, misinterprets uh, some particular factors 
users and misinterprets the uh, data, the objective data which is provided to it. So the most important thing is uh, that uh, AI uh, cannot be affected by some particular um, outside factors, external factors. And actually, it is very objective and it is not very, um, not very sensitive to uh, some changes on the in the external situation. But it depends very much on the algorithms that we uh, that, that we we allowed uh, allow it to use. But um, uh, MIT researchers uh, created the moral machine experiment. And uh, so it included 200 participants from different uh, from different uh, cities, and uh, so it uh, used the experiment, the scenario of the experiment with a carriage. Uh, in uh, the experiment, uh, simulated the accident with the carriage, which um, killed people, and the only uh, with, with only with a single survivor. Um, and then people analyzed the composition of the experiment. Uh, so who participated, who was uh, to be killed, who were, who were the those members uh, who, who were victims, and who was the sole survivor, um, and uh, the average rate of survival, and so on. Yeah, so, and that made it possible to conclude uh, just uh, how, uh, well, just the differences between the uh, artificial intelligence decision making and the human decision making. Yeah, and it's uh, well, just it identifies the differences in this decision making process. Движение, то есть детям они обычно стараются спасать детей, женщин, и они в меньшей степени склонны спасать мужчин. И то есть понятно. It's quite clear that these were commercial technologies as a rule, and the customer might not be satisfied with that. So this is the reason why we prioritize these or that. Customer. The research also found difference between regions, and in different countries there are different preferences. Uh, they are similar generally, but in some countries they prefer uh, inaction, so they prefer not to turn. So if it moves in the right direction, then let it be. In some countries, priority is given to the people, to the elderly people, and it also makes us think what norms do we uh, norms we can. Uh, we follow. So, what the, such projects are criticized for? First of all, uh, this. First of all, this is consequentialism. So, the focus here is on the result. Second, the moral machine makes us express our uh, partiality. Uh, it might be a kind of uh, sexism, ageism, but uh, these questions in, in kind uh, maculate us, and we may ask a question why there should be discrimination instead of correcting that. But if we correct that, so we start talking about paternalism, so some norms are imposed on us. Third, this is incorrect usage of the experiment. Uh, some people believe so, because it's not developed for practical cases, it's developed for test positions in general because they dis do distinguish between letting die and killing. And the, develop, uh, the developer of this experiment also believed that. So, still, I believe that these critics is not completely justifiable because these thought experiments could be used without absolutization, but not only the decision who should be saved, it should be taken into account, but, sh but reason should also be taken into account, and then the research would stop being just a game. As far as I have time limit, I will move to the idea of moral car. So, uh, computing ethics. So, we've been talking about the opinion of the interviewed. Uh, these are all opinions, but they are strategies for giving certain competences to, uh, the, to machines. The ethic competence. On the, on, on the one hand, there is movement uh, from up, down, 
Кристофера Клауса, основанный на принципах утилитаризма. То есть... There were different approaches, uh, different projects, and but the natural problem here is given to uh, the uh, condition of breaking the rules, and also there is a tendency uh, from up. Uh, from down upwards. So these are the preferences which are mainly used. There are also some hybrid approaches. When there are some principles uh, which goes from uh, uh, da downwards and upwards, so, but it would be undesirable if the choice between the cases and the choice based on the principles. So the main point is that this choice would not be coincidental for a person. Uh, for for a machine, it's a rather technical coincidence. There are some approaches which base on general AI, artificial in intelligence. Tartan Tartan developed coherent extrapolate extrapolation. It it implies that super intellects find something common for all individuals. It's something as a mistake of choosing something in between. If you have a road only to the right and to the right, but we choose to go straight forward, so we get to the deadlock. And probably there is some undesirable by, by anybody consensus. And uh, computing probability is not very high here. So, what resources should be used for this? On the other hand, there is an approach which is based on compassion and respect. It is mainly utilitarian, so the machine is trained observing preferences of people in different situations, and it maximizes people's preferences. So, it may lead to discrimination of certain groups, uh, because it depends on our preferences. A lot of ideas, or most of those ideas is on paper and uh, still there are some modern approaches which uh, summarize some of them for example Edmund Watt and others and the main idea of that of their works is to formulate the I, I, idea of ethics in algorithm which would correspond to our moral uh, values they try to unite the interests of different parties concerned basing on mathematical, uh, mathematical models. <laughs> they uh, consider understanding uh, conventions, understanding of uselessness basing on some uh, ethical behavior. And this project presupposes constant testing uh, of new cases for improving the algorithm. This is one of the main principles in developing artificial intelligence, so, so that it would be possible to interfere in some certain stages. Uh, so I have three minutes more. There are some restrictions at this approach to ethics. On the one hand, uh, that moral norms are reduced to algorithm, it uh, makes uh, some ethnical principles to be lost. Uh, but ethics of uh, virtue also helps to investigate different cases, but still there should be some exceptions. Uh, it's very it's very questionable how we can expect some wisdom from a machine. We cannot uh, uh, expect some ethics, Haber, uh, Habermas, uh, Habermas ethics from a machine. Some psychological research indicate that it's not possible to find a consequence of moral uh, on the other hand, in ethical uh, conclusions, there, is, there are quite often uh, 
по сути, они также требуют... In general, they also require some kind of uh, power of one ethnical system and probably uh, compromise which nobody requires. The system which, doesn't, which is not liked by everyone but similar to all others. On the other hand, similar cognitive situations are very complicated. Consequentialist... Consequentialist machine receives some results where we know we know this result, but what to do if we don't know the result? Because quite often forecasts can't be done in many situations. The same happens with the duty. It is very difficult to uh, input some duty into a machine because for a machine it's very difficult to understand what is. Uh, what duty is. And uh, finalizing my speech, I would like to say that implementation of moral machines in the future is problematic in the future because these are special moral agents which could be uh, hacked. Uh, we don't expect that people can be hacked and would be differ different while a machine could be hacked and uh, there could be failure in machine and it could take some contradictory solutions. And the principle of trust is, under, or, uh, is undermined. In my opinion, philosophical analysis of this problem should move from uh, regulativity, as it was shown in some articles about the uh, mulching proposal, we can justify anything. We can justify optimization of regulating of almost any technology in spite of some moral prerequisites which were not applicable at the very beginning. And so, in conclusion, I would like to say that keeping in mind uh, that all this ethnical research is aimed at regulation of uh, powerful artificial intelligence, real situations quite often are connected with other solutions. They're connected with uh, mistakes or failures in May. 2018, uh, an Uber car could not identify a passerby, and uh, there was an accident. So, in this, uh, hence we can ask questions about uh, moral solutions and entrusting with taking uh, with the uh, uh, power to take solutions. However, this is quite an important field because technological process requires philosophical assessment of possible problems in the future. So, in this lecture, I try to outline the top of an iceberg in this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you. Uh, distinguished colleagues, you can ask uh, so you you can put on the headset uh, so if you want to use the um, ah, you, you can you can use the um, hands, uh, headset for uh, carrying for holding the tablet uh, so if you need to uh, to hold something in your hands you can use the device to help it uh, to help you with it so the next participant is a Tolkien so yeah, just the floor is yours. You're welcome. Thank you. Before I start my presentation on in cooperation uh, of philosophy and theology uh, in uh, Christian and Islam cultures, I would like to give a short poem which I composed being inspired by this work. Or, so the wisdom clashes the uh, faith and intellect and it sparks it sparks our moral principles and it sparks our wisdom and it brings us to some uh, certain 
solutions. So that is the plan of my presentation. And uh, first, I would like to uh, introduce you to my topic and uh, what uh, the cooperation of these two disciplines is and uh, how it is limited and what the views on this problem uh, problem are then there will i will speak about materials and methodology and i will classify the models of cooperation or correlation between philosophy and theology then i will go into detail about the integral forms of cooperation between philosophy and theology, and then dissoci dissociative uh, forms of cooperation between theology and philosophy. And then my favorite uh, point is the results, uh, the, well, discussion of the results and some limitations to the research. So first, I will give uh, the short uh, summary of uh, the um, of uh, my topic. So, um, in spite of the fact that there are cu current opinions um, of the special uh, that there is a current tendency uh, to prevent uh, the cooperation a bit of between philosophy and theology, and, and uh, there are some tendencies to just oppose these uh, two disciplines. So we have to find uh, some common ground for them. And the first uh, thing is uh, uh, the constant attempts of humanity to find some uh, something in common between uh, philosophy and theology in understanding the background of life. And that's so, and uh, so we ha we find this common ground in uh, learning the everything that is connected to God, um, and uh, bringing together these two disciplines, we can understand that uh, our Lord, uh, the God, is. Uh, uh, the background for everything that exists in, in the world. And then we come to synergy of these two disciplines rather, to, uh, rather than to separation of them. But uh, some thinkers uh, argue that and the representatives of this uh, school uh, of uh, cooperation between theology and philosophy uh, argue that uh, these are two absolutely independent, not related uh, disciplines, which pursued uh, absolutely different objectives. And uh, some thinkers even speak about the conflict between these two sides and some antagonist character of their relations. So the introduction, uh, when we uh, study uh, the religions, uh, we find absolutely uh, well, we, we find the strikal, striking differences, in, but at the same time similarities between philosophy and religion. Yeah, so the theologists use the same data and the same um, the same motives and uh, plots uh, when they identify the background for their religion. At the same time, they refer to the same to similar evidence uh, to support their conclusions, and that uh, actually refers refers to the axiology um, and when they speak about uh, the uh, when they speak about the virtues and sins and uh, 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 but at the same time, philosophers like Hegel uh, so also spoke about the same values and the same uh, the same sins, and uh, they spoke about probability and certainty. Uh, they also refer to the um, issues of epistemology and they also think about the wisdom and the character of wisdom because uh, wisdom is pure, wisdom is pious, and wisdom is filled with uh, our understanding of our virtues. They also speak about uh, some moral laws, and we can refer to the works of Sharia, uh, the, the works of um, Aristotle, Hegel, and Kant. Um, so these two disciplines can be defined as one, 
But one of the favorite uh, reason of uh, critics uh, is uh, just uh, refers to the, the same issues that are analyzed by religion, uh, by theologists, and uh, by the philosophies. So actually, you can uh, interpret the same issues. Uh, as the evidence to bring the philosophy and religion together. But at the same time, philosophy has got a very specific way of development and very specific experience on learning uh, faith and uh, power. But uh, religion theology uh, very much dwells on uh, mind and uh, common sense. So these are um, then we used some philosophical and comparative uh, methods of research, and we based it on different works of theologists and philosophers, uh, both from Christian and Is Islamic religions, and I added. I I divided uh, all forms of interaction into two main forms, uh, integral and so then integral uh, further on was developed, uh, was divided into uh, contrast and uh, comparative forms and then the dissociative form which is split into two forms which is split into well, unfortunately, I cannot uh, I, I, I cannot coin uh, two terms. Uh, I cannot uh, uh, coin the two, uh, two certain terms to name uh, these two trends, but I call them as Raskolshina, which is the split and disagreement. So the split and disagreement. So uh, the in integral model does not differentiate uh, philosophy and theology. So it speaks about intellectual task, uh, the task of understanding what God is, and contrast uh, form that uh, rejects philosophy uh, from its uh, belonging to, phil to religion. And according to this point of view, we have to use all possible sources which correlate with the topic of our research. And it also um, uh, testifies to the Mm, a correlation between our research and the necessity to study the religious texts. And then it will also define uh, the major character of our work, whether it refers to theological studies or to philosophical studies. Then uh, if, we, um, if uh, there is some overlapping or if there is some doubling of approaches, um, uh, we can witness uh, just we can um, we can see some challenges in our research. Then I will also give some examples. Uh, it's about the cooperation between philosophy and theology in early uh, Christianity before scholastic approach in medieval universities. So there was no differentiation and there was no difference between these two studies and two disciplines. For example, Anthelm from Canterbury of Canterbury uh, qualified his uh, works as religious or philosophical and he actually didn't see the difference between philosophical and religious texts and philosophical and religious uh, studies. Uh, the Islamic culture shows a good example of such cooperation and so that is Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, and Avicenna were the best representatives of this approach, and so they uh, focused on, uh, on theological aspect of studies. Then, let me say about the contra uh, a contrast form of integral interaction of philosophy of theological philosophy uh, alike philo uh, so philosophy and theology are different but mutually uh, dependent forms of philosophy uh, 
these disciplines uh, quite rarely can contradict each other, and they rather overlap different fields of study. They have the same references to to different sources. However, however, these overlapping is not deep, is not absolute, because. De- develop uh, studying theo- uh, theology and philosophy start from different starting points. Here I can give some examples. It's the uh, I can uh, give here Thomas uh, Aquinas who believed that philosophy theology is- It's on Thiele Theologia, so this is the servant for philosophy. Uh, they believe that uh, modern th- philosophy, uh, contemporary philosophy used some concepts used by the- theology. At the same time, Thomas believe, uh, emphasized that theology can take something from philosophy. Uh, From Islamic culture, we can mention Al-Farabi, who didn't deny religion, who believed that if religion relies upon philosophy uh, and based on principle of openness, it could be considered real and precious. precious. So he confirmed uh, the, uh, the, uh, the importance of religion in solving philosophical questions. Now, I would like to speak about splitting, so to say. This is a form of interaction between uh, of, of, uh, interaction between philosophy and theology. Uh, we can mention here, uh, so people representing this uh, trend They did not uh, subdue philosophy to theology and don't consider philosophy as the only instrument for solving theological problems. They believe that the differentiation between the truths of, of faith and reason are not sufficient and these differences could be taken into account uh, together with different aspects of research. For example, approaches and methods Uh, supporters of this uh, so their ideas are not very peculiar for philosophy and they would rather refer to science in general but not to philosophy itself in Christian culture this interaction takes a very, uh, quite an important position in theology. For example, Martin Luther, Luther were supporters of this approach. They did not take, uh, they didn't believe Martin Luther believed that these uh, thoughts proceed from different sources and have different Uh, reasons or different purposes. In, in Islamic culture, there is a certain field or direction philosophy, a great role in for, for development of this context was played by Ibn Rush. He developed the concept of dual truth. People who followed this uh, so Avroyus supported the 
uh, the true proposals of the philosophy and religion. Uh, but at the same time, he insisted on interpretation of the religious text. So he said that philosophy is the only instrument uh, to come to the truth. At the same time, Islamic culture identifies Ghazali, uh, who uh, criticized Ibn Rushd, but at the same time, in his works, uh, he tried to demonstrate impossibility uh, to construct some uh, to construct something that opposes the religious texts. So he said that physics and mathematics cannot be used to test the religious texts. So and he tried to oppose the philosophy and metaphysics. Then the split. The split uh, identifies or uh, focuses on antagonism between philosophy and uh, religion. And so these are the examples, Tertullian. And he, uh, he said that philosoph philosophy is absolutely uh, op opposes the Christianity. So, but when I checked the uh, papers and studies, uh, so such opinion dominates only in the Russian translations and Russian philosophy. The uh, English-speaking or just the Eng the f papers we which were published in English, uh, so do not hold the same opinion. And the conclusion. The results, different forms of cooperation between philosophy and theology were specific for some particular historical periods. And the above mentioned classification is very rough. And it, um, um, it, uh, well, it brings together only the philosophers of um, Christianity and Islam. Uh, any cat all the categories can be divided into uh, small subcategories uh, depending on the elements and uh, the factors which are taken into consideration. And it demonstrates the complexity of the issue, uh, which opposes to the naive interpretation of cooperation between philosophy and uh, religion. Uh, so, the historical background plays the key role in a good analysis of the relations between philosophy and theology. And that is the only tool uh, which can identify the borders and the frames uh, for such cooperation. Uh, after I have studied the papers and theological and philosophical works, uh, I understood that uh, the only thing that you can be certain about is the uh, non-dominance of some particular signs uh, in, uh, the, in, in the, for the humanity. And of course, uh, the situation differs depending on the historical period. And uh, the Renaissance time is a very good example of that, when a religion was dominate, uh, dominated the philosophy. But at the same time, we can say that Islam, uh, the Islam religion, Islamic religion, uh, limited uh, philosophic um, philosophic dominance over theology because of various limitations that exist in the in the religion in Islamic religion itself. So the limitations depend on the access to the uh, theoretical works, then on the uh, religion denomination of the, um, well, just of the researcher or of the scientist himself. Uh, so that means that um, Islamic uh, scientists did not have very good access to Christian works. And then uh, the comprehensive attitude uh, to or comprehensive understanding of the uh, problem uh, requires the analysis of the other religions uh, which exist in the world. Thank you. I hope that it was interesting. So thank you so much. Thank you. Colleagues, I suggest that I suggest uh, listening to eight eight people and then we make a short break. So now I'd like to give the floor to uh, 
uh, Madina Vaspakova. Здравствуйте, уважаемые жюри, уважаемые участники. Сегодня я хочу вас познакомить. Hello, esteemed jury, dear participants. I'd like to uh, talk about uh, neuro phenomenon. So, my research consists of a classical approach to the uh, notion of transcendental subject the non-classical approach and the dilemma of transcendental subject in, in works of uh, some. So the first who introduced this notion, transcendental subject, was Immanuel Kant. Transcendental subject refers to the cognitive abilities. Actually, transcendental subject is the combination of cognitive abilities, but within Kant's triad, sensibility, uh, reason, etc. So, a transcendental subject could make a priori the transcendental unity of our perceptions is a special insta a substance which is in transcendental subject. It's responsible for all the thoughts that they are uh, grouped around some inner core. This core uh, within a transcendental subject generates some inner feeling. I'm thinking. It is, it is me who is thinking. All that is going on within me is mine. That's uh, so. Here proceeds the unity of of a subject and the opinion. Otherwise, it would. Uh, the experience would uh, fall apart into different thoughts. Uh, then, René Descartes, in his thought, the community is an instrument of cognition and understanding of personal mind. So, cognito ego sum, I'm thinking, means that I am existing, it refers to transcendental dimension where so, something which subject understands gets beyond the world, the existing world. As for the juxtaposition of subject object, there is an ontological and gnosiological um, attitude. Uh, ontological uh, uh, defines two substances, the stretched is object and thinking that is subject. So subject does something with the object or to the object, and object is inanimate. Gnosiological uh, juxtaposition can be seen in Kant's work. So the object is our world, and we study it. The world comprises uh, the uh, well, the things in themselves, and we cannot uh, learn them. Then transcendental subject and uh, the founder of this non-classical uh, approach is uh, Schopenhauer. And uh, in his works, will is a constant element of uh, human being that's non-changeable imperative, and the understanding of individuum of the object uh, are directed by uh, his will, and it's a non-classical understanding of transcendental, when the transcendental qualities belong to uh, the thinking individuum, individual. Then Edmund Gusev, uh, so he 
school started started uh, um, I am from uh, hedonistic activity of the subject and transcendental subject is individualized with some certain features and qualities of I am I am material I am physical I am thinking I suggest I imagine I doubt and uh, the scientist uh, ap appeals to a unique quality of our mind so the intention uh, so the intention the desire to create intention so the fact that you see me is your intention because your attention is directed at me and the main uh, phenomenological idea is that the consciousness is the intention to cooperate with the outside, with the external world. And then the subject has got uh, the connection to the world, life, and transcendental uh, entity. So that is the common Re, uh, objective reality, and that becomes the central idea in non-classical research. Non-classical understanding of transcendental subject uh, refuses the dichotomy of transcendental and empirical I am. Yeah, being, uh, uh, transcendental being is passive, it is hidden, and it is uh, understood only through uh, our conscious approach and through our understanding. Empirical being, it's, um, it's uh, well, empirical being, it's the experience with our experiment with our consciousness. Then let's go on. And uh, that's the dilemma of transcendental subject in uh, phenomenologists' works and in activists' work. The phenomenology, uh, uh, the, uh, the founder of the phenomenology is Francisco Varela, the Chilean uh, researcher uh, who consolidates the uh, possibilities the, or the capacities of cognitive scientists through uh, um, through getting back to the uh, first person narration first person experience and so then and the phenomenological uh, experience is activated through mathematical models uh, without uh, without getting back to the uh, to personal experiences, it is impossible to understand the reality. But at the same time, uh, the uh, being, uh, the narrator, cannot um, evaluate the experiences objectively. Uh, so the idea is to to give the objective assessment to our subjective experiences. That's like medical examination when you come to the doctor. The doctor uh, has to uh, objectively understand what is wrong with you, but at the same time, he evaluates your subjective um, emotions and your subjective experiences. Then, according to this neurophenomenology, the mind is not a pure thought. It appears only it appears only in cooperation with material world and it is embodied in some being so this physical contact is the background of mind in activism in its uh, in its um, well statement um, says that the agent must be incorporated into the environment and neuroactivism develops the um, new uh, phenomenological concept uh, so in activism uh, there are no borders between border uh, there is no borders between object subject and the external world the understanding of intellect and mind must be constructed in the context with the environment and right now the ie uh, refers to uh, inactivism and inactivism or integration in the world can be understood through the examples of two robots asimo and big dog and i will i'm gonna show you some short video Японский автопроизводитель отнесся к новинке серьезно. 
А Сима постепенно научился быстро передвигаться по неровной поверхности, преодолевать препятствия, выполнять несложные действия. И вот сегодня мир увидел нового андроида. 130-сантиметровый Асима не только обучился быстро бегать и прыгать на одной ноге. Робот научился узнавать людей, распознавать голоса трех одновременно говорящих человек. Но самое главное... Uh, смотрите, в первом случае робот... So, in the first case, the robot is programmed uh, for the environment where it works. It has inner representation. And here, representation is understood as a set of special, special algorithms uh, which are used uh, by this robot. So, uh, in opposition to that, Big Dog, another robot, acts... Uh, In this case, you can see that the robot adapts to unknown environment very quickly. It uses dynamical uh, interaction with uh, the environment. It uses uh, spring legs, which do not need programming, and very quickly adapt to the environment. If mind and the body are connected, and the mind uh, signals to the to the external to the environment to the external environment, we can ch change this in cognitive sciences. So consciousness is always uh, within the body, but it is, but it preserves its phenomenological origin. So coming. To the conclusion, I would like to say that fundamentality of theoretical positions of neurophenomenology and neuroactivism, uh, there must be some ambiguity in the approaches. First of all, uh, the relation between the biological body and the mind could not be transparent, which can be confirmed by empirical data of neurobiology, for example, uh, 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 dreams, uh, phantom, uh, limb, uh, feelings. So we cannot correlate body with the mind. So we cannot correlate uh, the space with the feeling, with the sensation of that space. Uh, conscious is always primary. If Immanuel Kant started, started uh, thinking about the transcendental with the questions of reason or mind, so neurotheologists with the uh, start this with these things. I know that uh, there are a lot of people who are not philosophers here, so I'd like to explain that. For example. You can see now that I have a piece of paper in my hand. So, epistemistic asymmetry implies that this physical object is public for you, and each of you can see it in your mind. This is confirmation that you have this uh, mind. But psychological experience, so your subjective insight, cannot be lived by me. So. Uh, activism and neurophenomenology try to remove this difference. So then I think that our vision of ourselves and vision of others uh, is not the same. I mean to say that we have a lot of open problems or issues connected with the integration of neurophenomenology and inactivism, but in spite of that, of those gaps, uh, this is a very urgent in the field of artificial intelligence and philosophy of consciousness. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Medina. So, I would like to invite Ksenia Grigorieva. Так, 
Всем добрый день. Меня зовут Ксения. Я... Uh, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Ксения. I'm a student of Moscow State University, the Faculty of Philosophy, and today I would like to uh, present such a brief uh, presentation the field of near philosophy and problems of artificial intelligence. Within the task, we had to uh, present the achievements of philosophy. And uh, at uh, uh, for the beginning, I would like to reflect on this topic. In, the connect in connection with this topic, I, we, we may raise some questions. How can we single out some achievements of philosophy? What are the criteria for uh, specifying them, uh, for specifying achievements from non-achievements. I believe that philosophy is a kind of knowledge or field of knowledge where even if we can single out some achievements, we can do that only in retrospective, so many and many years after. That's why there are no ach achievements of philosophy or science in my presentation. I will just be reflecting on this topic. First of all, if, first of all, I would like to start with the topic of popularization and to reflect on why we need to popular, popularize neuroscience and uh, artificial intelligence and, and, and uh, neurophilosophy. So neurophilosophy deals with the, with the problems of, of the brain, as we all know. And in this connection, there is a question. Why do we have to study the brain? For me personally, it's very interesting. I have a kind of pleasure doing that. But uh, if uh, but speaking seriously, I would like to single out two fields uh, or two directions where results of neurophilosophy could be uh, very productive. This is medicine, where achievements of uh, neuroscience are very important, especially uh, keeping in mind that we are living in, in the society where human life is especially precious. And then it's pedagogy. Because in this case, we are talking about uh, teaching and the results of neurosciences can uh, make it possible for us to develop uh, this, uh, develop strategies of, of efficient uh, teaching. So, why these two uh, fields, body, consciousness, physical reality, and mental reality, that's, that these were the principles why I... Uh, separated these two things. So now I would like to speak about artificial in intelligence. And here I think, first of all, about popular uh, idea about the dangers of artificial intelligence, some threat, uh, so, some uh, fears that artificial intel intelligence can enslave human beings. I will not focus on that. I believe some other participants of uh, this Olympiad will speak about that in detail. I would also like to say that I have already mentioned that popularization of the of this topic of artificial intelligence is connected with ethical ethical issues, and in this connection we have some uh, thoughts of methodological character as for how much all the disciplines are interconnected, both philosophical and scientific, and uh, such moments you start to understand logical positivists who, who dreamt about creating a unified science. So now I will move to the topic of balance 
between artificial intelligence and neuroscience. First of all, I'd like to say that they are part of a complex of sciences, which are called cognitive sciences. Uh, there we also have linguistic psychology, theory of cognition, and some other. It's believed that they are equal within cognitive sciences. But still, I believe that might be a hierarchy of the of the sciences. And to illustrate that, I will I will tell you about a case. A company DeepMind developed a computer system, AlphaGo, which won in Chinese game of Go a professional player. That event. Uh, made a lot of controversy because if you speak about ethnical aspects of artificial intelligence, uh, there are some concerns uh, that artificial intelligence is becoming very powerful. And I mentioned this company because the research director for neurosciences of that company said that for developing developments in the field of artificial intelligence, they used achievements in neurosciences. So it means that neuroscience is prime, primary in relation to artificial intelligence. And here we can have another uh, look from, the, from another angle, because it turns out to be servant, a kind of servant. Actually, it has it has never been so, has never always been so. Artificial intelligence science used the developments of uh, cognitive science, uh, new neurosciences. Everything started with computer metaphor. At early stages, the developers of artificial intelligence based their works on the structure of computer. They believe that the human brain operates as a computer, that there is an input information, output, data, and the brain processes that, that information. But if we use this approach, then we have some problems, both in the field of neuro, neuro, neurophilosophy and artificial intelligence. First of all, about neurophilology, why this approach was uh, not correct. Uh, first, it should be mentioned why, why we can't describe the brain with the help of computer metaphor. If we uh, say that uh, the brain works this uh, some particular way, we have got the incoming information which is translated into some symbolic language and then the brain works with this symbolic information, then the cognitive process is falls into two uh, parts or so splits into physical world and mental world. And uh, But philosophy uh, does not exercise uh, this approach because it is not satisfactory. Uh, the same as, uh, so th this metaphor works rather badly in uh, for artificial intelligence because even for uh, robotics and for some uh, applied uh, fields of artificial intelligence, this computer metaphor uh, uh, sees or fails to become uh, to be inspiring, and it uh, well just it didn't give rise to any developments, further developments, and uh, uh, well, uh, it's kind of very um, good coincidence that the previous speaker also uh, mentioned the same uh, issues, but I have a little bit different approach uh, to this inactivism. And uh, this uh, this approach, uh, and you know now you know about much about inactivism from the previous presentation. But this approach, um, this uh, approach states that we cannot forget about active. Uh, active interaction, active physical interaction with, with the environment. And uh, this is very much exercised uh, by cognitive sciences. And 
that has been has been done or has been stated by some other sciences. And if uh, we speak about robotics, uh, we can uh, refer to smart house. And there are robots with artificial intelligence which have some physical sensors and they interact with the external world. And such idea has become very productive and inspiring for AI development. What is this? That's, uh, well, uh, that is my... Uh, graph, which is, uh, well, rather generalized. And you see how the, uh, well, this transfer was exercised. So first the uh, computer was the background, and uh, then uh, now, but now we use brain as the background for the computational research, and that is based on an activism uh, idea. And uh, so why, why so what I'm going to uh, talk about? we. Uh, so that's because we don't know actually which signs uh, will uh, become the further background for artificial intelligence. Probably artificial, artificial intelligence research will be become the fundamental uh, science or fundamental uh, idea for the other uh, sciences to develop. I watched a video uh, produced by the director of DeepMind company, and uh, so it was rather metaphorical, but he said that in uh, aircraft building, uh, they, ca they came to the point when the researchers stopped using the achievements, uh, achievements of the science which studied the bird fly. And at some particular moment, uh, the artificial intelligence uh, will no longer use uh, the, mm, the study of computers, but probably it will switch to some other science. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, there are four minutes which Xenia has saved. Probably somebody uh, wants to come up with a question or to initiate a discussion. No? Then thank you. Thank you. And before we make a break, we are going to have another presentation, and that is Vladimir Gunko. Well, you're welcome. The floor is yours. Mm, and unfortunately, the... In, uh -huh, yep, now everything is good. So, first I would like to uh, express my gratitude to the organizers for this perfect opportunity to be here. And I come from Belarus, and that's my second time here, and I'm happy that uh, new tendencies make our countries closer, at least in uh, our in education and research. And the topic I would like to talk about today, that's contemporary neurophilosophy and uh, AI issues. And my major task is to popularize uh, the topic and uh, influence uh, the audience, uh, the general audience, the public, uh, well, and to raise their awareness of why philosophy is a very interesting and developing science. Uh, uh, the, these are several points of my presentation, so the um, uh, achievements of uh, AI, uh, issues and challenges of AI, uh, how well we know ourselves, and uh, then uh, when I speak about uh, the next part about uh, what if it is possible, I will introduce you to some experiments uh, which show us some black spots or some uh, some gaps in our understanding of ourselves. And then I will conclude with the uh, cooperation or the connection between the uh, artificial intelligence and human mind. Of course, AI is a very popular topic today, and it is uh, well just it's uh, topical for the uh, for the research and achievements that medicine, and we use AI in uh, diagnostics and uh, 
uh, studies, uh, medical studies, and then advertisements or advertising. Very often you can see the target uh, advertising. Uh, so when when you go through the social networks, uh, then the politics, and of course the, these are political forecast and political predictions when uh, the candidates can use artificial intelligence uh, for choosing the best place, venue, and day uh, for the for their uh, speeches and for their interaction with the public. Uh, then industry uh, to identify the best uh, workload for some departments or for some particular working teams. Then when we think about the achievements of AI, we can say that uh, that the uh, the AI, when it takes the average uh, secondary school examination in the United States, for example, gets the average, uh, get average degree, average point. Then, uh, well, AE is also used in legislation and in court practice when uh, the average uh, um, prison sentence is calculated by the AE. Um, our Mm, our achievements, uh, our achievements that these are developments by Sberbank, when uh, it studies the physical condition of the customer uh, to identify some medical conditions and to identify the COVID um, COVID conditions. But uh, of course, there are some uh, lots of worries about AI and the achievements and AI, whether it is it uh, uh, threatens the uh, humanity. But now we can say that AI does not threaten. The humanity, and we are not going to speak about the uh, riot of machines, but uh, we have to study the most positive and productive uh, examples and ways how uh, artificial in intelligence can be integrated into our life. And uh, now we can think about the efficient AI or the productive AI, and we have to ask ourselves, what is AI? In the beginning of 1980s, Baron Fagenbaum uh, uh, defined AI as uh, the um, field of information technologies which develops the computer systems uh, which have the capacities of uh, being connected to the human activities. Yeah, like that's the well machine learning or learning um, understanding and uh, well identification identifying the feelings. Further, the artificial intelligence started solving some uh, some tasks. Uh, the same way as the humans do it. And that means that uh, the artificial intelligence, uh, the success of artif artificial intelligence depends on how deeply we can study our own mind. So how well do we know ourselves? Uh, since the ancient times, uh, people have been asking our, uh, themselves where we come from, what we are, and what it means to be yourself, and uh, what is consciousness and where it comes from, and why uh, such a non-material, non-tangible thing uh, defines all our existence. It's difficult to explain our existence with behavioral studies. And then experimental psychology comes to, to stage. Uh, so it has done lots of uh, wonderful achievements which demonstrate how little we know about ourselves. And I would like to introduce a couple of uh, scientific achievements which uh, make us doubt uh, the, uh, well, uh, the, well, the depth of our knowledge. So the blind uh, vision phenomenon, and it was discovered by Nick, Nicholas Humphrey, and uh, so it means that the light comes to the retina and it goes to the neural uh, tissues and it goes to the uh, to the brain, and if uh, uh, the brain tissues are. Um, are broken or are uh, hurt, so uh, the other uh, the other areas um, uh, start working. Uh, so we compens uh, compensate for the broken uh, links, and uh, the humans go on uh, seeing the objects with uh, some other areas of our brain. So the experiment was conducted on uh, the monkeys, and. Uh, 
слепым зрением. Uh, the blind vision, the blind vision uh, actually proved that we sometimes can see the objects which are not within the uh, the scope of our vision, and it means that we can. Uh, sense uh, the objects uh, without any particular eye vision. Then the experiment, uh, well, unknown or um, the invisible gorilla, and uh, the uh, well, the participants of the experiment, the, ob the subjects of the experiment, uh, were demonstrated uh, the uh, teams who are throwing, uh, who were throwing the ball to each other. And then, uh, so they counted uh, the, uh, the ball uh, catches, and then they were asked whether they could see gorilla. So, and they were very surprised, and they didn't notice any gorilla. And then uh, the subjects were shown uh, the video again, and then after uh, being focused on the video, they could notice gorilla, which uh, came into the, um, uh, which came into the shot, uh, in the twentieth uh, second of the experiment. They were very surprised. So then, the Limbert experiment. The question was, how is it possible to describe the actions of a human being if, uh, at some rational level? The standard scheme of the algorithm in action looks like this. So here we can see de desire, uh, intention, uh, conscious impulse, and uh, action. Uh, so in this scheme, we can see that conscious impulse is the most important. It's something which uh, thinking, something uh, uh, intangible, interferes into the real world. It is known that in certain par parts of uh, the brain there is a readiness potential which can be uh, registered with. Uh, uh, so here we can see it plays. So the person who was connected to this device uh, must say in which position the uh, arrow is. So the experiment was carried out for several seconds, but it was repeated for several times in order to uh, avoid a mis uh, mistake. So the results of the experiment were surprising. Conscious decision to raise a hand uh, hundreds milliseconds uh, legs behind the potential of readiness. So, uh, this experiment questioned uh, the issue of freedom of wish. So, uh, whether our uh, uh, is it possible that any our conscious action is determined by the processes uh, going on in the brain? Experiments for uh, diff diffusion of uh, hemispheres of brain. So, um, there were some surgical operation for uh, dissection of parts of the brain. So, originally it was thought that such surgical operations have no serious consequences, but then we had uh, there were some evidence of uh, the vice versa. So, uh, left hemisphere is responsible for auditory or for speech. And if in experimental uh, conditions uh, a person with split hemispheres is given some uh, objects, for example, we show uh, a pencil to the left hemisphere and a cup to the right hemisphere. So, uh, and asked, and the uh, asked, what did you see? The most surprising is that during this experiment, researchers could talk to the to the hemispheres, brain hemispheres, who behave as different personalities. When talking to the left hemisphere, simple nonverbal 
uh, communication. Uh, so this experiment raises some is- questions of philosophical character. Are there two personalities in one body or only one hemisphere is a personality, the left one, and the right one is only guided by instincts? These questions are open for discussion, but still we have to, we must confess that human oneself is not unified. So in conclusion, I would like to express a general conclusion which was made from this result. This is a recognition of the fact that we know very little about who we are and what makes us ourselves. The problem of consciousness of consciousness is a question which we have to answer in the future if we want to achieve some uh, be, some points in studying. Uh, our intelligence, we change the world, we create something new, we achieve something which was not impossible before. We we are capable of doing that because of the work of our conscious. This is one of the uh, most efficient instruments, but it's paradoxical that we don't know how this instrument works. And now, in the 23rd century, we have a task, a very ambitious task, to create a model of conscious. Uh, we can select different criteria which will assess the work of our artificial intelligence. We will make some progress in development of this technology. We will get closer to this goal. But no matter how uh, close we uh, get to this goal, but we will not reach it until uh, humankind will solve the problem of uh, human self-conscious. Thank you very much. Thank you. Colleagues. I suggest having a break until uh, half past four. So we have about a 15 minute break. Uh, you can have some coffee, you can talk to each other. So you can have some rest so uh, that we are able to continue our work then.
Федотов Дмитрий Леонидович, пожалуйста, подойдите, нет презентации, если она у вас есть, пожалуйста, подойдите к техническому нашему замечательному. Нет, если она у вас есть, передайте, пожалуйста. Вам сейчас помогут. А если нет, то и нет, конечно, это, это вы уже решите, но если она есть, то подойдите, пожалуйста, и решите все вопросы. Я так понимаю, что время перерыва завершено. Алексей Павлович, да? Вы определяете. Продолжаем работать. Всем удачи. Сейчас технический вопрос. Так, у нас все на месте, переводчики. Everybody is here. Yes, I think that we can resume our work. Yeah, because everybody is ready and we can go on. We have got we have got seven presentations left. And uh, the other track, uh, they are in the same uh, with the same rate, so they are even a little bit behind. So we have. Uh, We have done eight presentations, so now the floor is given to Pavlina Kazakova, our next participant. You are welcome. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Pavlina Kozakova, and I am from. I'm a four-year student um, of Moscow State University, and I'm going to speak about algorithms of uh, uh, processing uh, of language processing and how they are going to, uh, which impact they are going to have on uh, the on the academic process. And I'm going to speak more about neural connections and neural links, neural networks, rather than artificial intelligence. Uh, so, and I'm not going to speak about the uh, chances of uh, developing artificial intelligence by um, the year nine, 1980. So, but we are going to speak about the development of neural networks and if it is possible to come up with a strong version of artificial intelligence. So, um, we are going to. Uh, well, our uh, the uh, the uh, our culture today can be described as the clip culture, and uh, to me it sounds a little bit strange, but uh, they say that uh, our current culture is very much connected to images, videos. But I do not totally agree with it, because uh, today we write quite much, or we read a lot. And our chats, news, even when we are lazy, we listen to something to replace reading. So something that uh, well is uh, that that has some plot and that has some performance like character. So some news podcasts or uh, books. So we live in a text-centric culture. And secondly. Even our main, well, even, even when you just go online, you have to type uh, the, uh, well, the, the, te the search text or choose from some text options. Um, I want to speak about generative trans pre-trained pre transformer, and that's one of the major algorithms 
algorithms of uh, uh, natural, natural language processing, open AI. It has been developing since uh, 2017 and it has been developing rapidly um, and now it is available in Russian. It appeared in Russian in 2020 and it was trained by a supercomputer. In English version, it, ha it was trained uh, on English language Wikipedia. Uh, the huge volume, huge uh, body of literature and uh, literature in different languages, but uh, the Russian literature uh, is represented by one tenth of percent. So, but in the Russian language uh, version is trained by uh, Russian Wikipedia. So um, let's uh, let's talk about it. What uh, our capacities are. So that is the network, and that was the network network of readers and authors. And first, we can make it read for you. Uh, make uh, it analyze the tone of text, and make it write some summary or resume or summary of uh, something that must be read. So it can differentiate, it can identify the voice and image. And uh, to some extent, uh, any identification, or, uh, identification system works on the um, background of text. Then the translators work. Uh, or it can do some translation. And actually, the future work of uh, writing something is connected to writing a code. And this neural network can replace writing, some kind of routine writing, some kind of routine task of writing. And it can be very useful in Apart from having, uh, or uh, it can be very useful f to uh, in generating different ideas. Uh, there are some examples of uh, its application. Like in 2016, the the final. Uh, the, fi the, uh, uh, the final of the literary competition saw uh, the novel the day when the computer uh, uh, will write or writes a novel. So it's, well, not the full novel was written by the computer, but anyway, a part of it. Yeah, so then uh, 2020, Daniel Suskind also uh, well presented uh, the book of uh, 350 50 pages written by a computer and then so in 2022 or, so the the translators were replaced by the inter, by the um, uh, online translating or translate um, well internet assisted translation um, so not very successfully, but still it has been some kind of replacement. And then uh, 2022, uh, another work, uh, it's a kind of endless dialogue uh, of uh, the director Werner Herzog and, philosoph and the philosopher Slavo Zizka. And so they have been talking about uh, something, and they, it's kind of a conversation, but I wouldn't say that it's the conversation. It's kind of parallel talk where they agree with each other, but at the same time, Zizek, uh, Zizek makes some, uh, well, just uh, Zizek uh, well, speaks uh, to the audience and to himself. So, and uh, we used to, we used to have a bot uh, which was uh, trained by two three uh, well critics uh, or critical approaches to Kant's uh, works, and if you want, so if you wanted to write something, uh, well some kind of um, well work on uh, Kant, uh, so you could have used this bot and you will have got the paper. 
you could have got the paper which was uh, well kind of uh, which which could replace the real academic paper uh, on Kant's work so but at the same time um, all these technologies do not have uh, the transcendental unity of perception. Of course, they can write non-fiction work, but uh, they cannot generate uh, co some kind of complex uh, content. Uh, let's say a long story with a plot uh, which uh, well considers all the details and which doesn't confuse everything. So they don't have this perceptive experience um, well, like human experience, yeah, so they don't feel, and uh, so then you can see lots of different, uh, uh, you can, you can, well, you can see different things, so different um, stylistic uh, things, stylistic de so stylistic devices which are not typical for human speech, uh, like, well, he sneezed with his eyes open or something like this, or because they do not have their own perception. Uh, this room, uh, because uh, do, uh, any process done by computer does not guarantee understanding of the process and presence of conscious. I don't know if it's a problem in this context because the neuro chains uh, were developed in order to fulfill some tasks. Uh, neuro chains is a kind of advance uh, notion because biologists say that it's very difficult to uh, calculate mathematically a movement of a cell. Uh, live, live below neurons, which are much more complicated, and neuron and connection between neurons. Uh, there are billions of neurons in the in the brain, and billions of those connections. So these uh, this name neuron networks. Uh, this is a data with very uh, very uh, big advance, so to say. And in some, in a sense, artificial intelligence for us is a black box. Here we can recall Bruno Latour. Uh, yes, they are working with tax, textual information. They receive it. Uh, something happens with this information in the process of its creation, and this information has, a, has some output without knowing uh, what is going on within this process. Even so, creators quite often say that they apologize for what this generator can say, but it doesn't mean that the generator is angry. You just can't think of uh, its teachers. So we taught it. And this black box. So there are some algorithms for processing uh, artificial language. We can make uh, collect a library for our tasks, but think. But if you want to create. Uh, our own algorithm. We need a supercomputer which will learn for quite a long time. There are very few computers like that in the world today. This new technology will require our revision, uh, revision of our attitude to the production of scientific knowledge. What I mean here? Lauren Dustin and Peter Gallison at the beginning of this millennia, millennium wrote a book where they consider how an 
objectivity in science was developing. They believe objectivity to be a pessimistic. So it's a virtue, intellectual virtue. And uh, it was Aristotle who started talking about uh, that. But in their understanding, uh, intellectual virtue is not a unified characteristic of a human being, that it's, it's an integral part of uh, his personality and life. And epistemological virtue is a kind of set where you can add something or include something or exclude something. So the main point here is to achieve its scientific goals. Dustin and Gallison studied uh, mainly sciences, natural sciences. So, and the example of such virtues could be university, objectivity. And what, what about humanities? Now, I'll be a bit provocative in academic point of view. Imagine uh, how scientific works are written. So, for example, there, there, there are philologists, and for more than 100 years, they've been writing different scientific works, for example, on Dostoevsky or Tolstoy. Knowledge in humanities very rarely is very rarely produced in laboratories, and uh, some absolutely new knowledge is very rarely produced. So, uh, these people mainly work with existing sources and try to interpret them in their understanding. So it turns out that these works have only reference character. It means that the person who writes a work has to select some literature, uh, do some work, uh, to go uh, to to use certain logics, uh, but there could be no novelty. But if all the criteria are met, then this work can exist in academic community. So the question is, what kind of epistemistic virtue is there? And I thought, uh, if humanitarian knowledge cannot always make some innovation, let's be frank. We all have some report or some article which was written just, just because we did that. So, in this case, it's possible. In this case, it's possible, uh, it's possible that one of uh, humanitarian virtues is is that of being an author and having subjective position. Probably it, it is possible to work proceeding from different viewpoints. It is possible to take some phenomenon and consider that uh, from a neutral point of view. But whatever you choose, within humanitarian knowledge. OK, so I have run out of time. I guess you understood my message. So what, what should be done if you want to achieve objectivity of humanitarian knowledge? Then you can, uh, you can try humanitarian. Uh, uh, it started in 1949 when Abeto Buzo came to IBM and suggested and offered uh, digitalization of uh, Thom uh, Thomas uh, Equiton. Actually, due to that attempt, nowadays we have something which we understand as digital literature nowadays. If you want to digitalize a text, you can uh, make a photo of it. But it's also uh, very important to make it uh, 
to be possible to be read by a machine. And to this issue, a project by uh, Thomas Aquitan Coppers was devoted to that. That's just a basic example from which a digital document, uh, documentary began. But we, if there is a task to achieve some objectivity, um, I don't know if it's needed at all, but if there is such a task, then in, in the future, when looking for some new topics, looking for some origin, originality, it might provide us with new methods and approaches. For example, we can identify style, we can identify the author. It would be possible to reconstruct texts and text layers. Quantitative research and uh, creation of cata catalog uh, collections. So here I'm finishing. Thank you. Uh, well, I apologize for interrupting you. It's not only our time, but it's the time of interpreters' work uh, who are facing the real challenge of uh, interpreting all this, and so that's uh, quite a difficult task. Uh, so uh, let's go on. Let's move on. And the next speaker is uh, uh, Ludmila Anatolievna Kait. Ludmila Kait, so you're welcome. Uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished uh, members of the jury, uh, participants of the Olympiad and uh, guests. Um, I would like to speak on, I would like to give my presentation, uh, which is based on the Russian philosophy and intellectual culture. And uh, I would like to speak about the concept of subordinate. So that is, uh, well, just the topic which is uh, very uh, relevant today and very urgent. Uh, first, uh, it resonates uh, to the current, uh, current uh, uh, life, our current agenda, and this collegiality is uh, something that really correlates with our present-day philosophy. It is understood by Western theoreticians uh, in a different way. Um, so uh, Natalia Rostova says that Western philosophy uh, witnesses transgression of uh, borders. We reduce uh, the uh, the otherness, we reduce the other thoughts, and we try to compromise on it in our s society. So in the Western philosophy, it is diluted and it is mixed with something else. Another reason is that uh, there is some social demand uh, for the uniqueness of thoughts, even in the nearest, in the recent uh, f festival on philosophy in Kazan, uh, the members of the general public asked speakers why um, they address uh, Western philosophy uh, while uh, trying to analyze the current issues. Probably it's better to address some Russian philosophers, and even the general public understands that it's the necessity of our current time, especially in, uh, well, just in the current agenda. Well, probably we have to look for some our, uh, for our unique um, way, unique, um, well, response, um, and, well, just what is, uh, and to understand what our response ability is. Very often it doesn't have the answer, and uh, trying to find some reference point, we are trying to speak about, we are, we are going to speak about collegiality as the matrix uh, which can become a background for our um, new understanding of our reality. At the same time, Western reality or Western agenda uh, is still relevant. And we have to give it some sort of to give it some sort of response because while borrowing uh, these Western uh, theories without 
um, critical analysis of them, we, um, we become theoretical and we, uh, uh, we are pressed by this theoretical approach because while the West uh, uses theory to analyze some uh, social movements, so then the series of queer, the, f f the series of uh, feminism were uh, shaped this way. But in Russia, when we uh, think about such concepts, we uh, find ourselves under the influence of some external factors. Then uh, we uh, also can say that the independence of our uh, of our attitudes in um, has a great impact on our behavior, and Clifford mentions that in his Ethics of Persuasion. Uh, so then, this reference point or this. Uh, turning point which can become the matrix of collegiality can become a brand or well the brand for the Russian philosophy because the word collegiality uh, can hardly be translated well but just I wrote it in my first first slide so bored so and that is that that is that that is the way how the word is represented in the English language so all this uh, all these meanings all these concepts uh, are going to be under uh, um, analyzed by us today. So uh, what is collegiality? What is subordinates? How can we understand its specific features? So uh, we have to get back to some religious patterns. And I proceed from the assumption that philosophy is uh, the reflection of culture. Uh, and the culture is based, or based on the cultural codes and the religious religious codes. And we will, um, we will carry on some uh, comparative studies Protestantism, Catholicism, um, and uh, Orthodox faith. So, what they have inside. So, Protestant religion is based on five, five basic principles, which take us to the freedom without unity. So, we have got the freedom of interpretation, but we are, we have to understand and we have to uh, interpret everything ourselves. So then. Uh, the uh, freedom of faith, but again, it is only Christ, it is only faith and nothing else. And again, we are left alone uh, before our God and we uh, do not have any support. And uh, so that is some kind of isolated individualism. Uh, within the Catholic para paradigm, we have got another issue. So we have got unity without freedom. And in the 19th century, uh, Catholic uh, faith uh, accepted the, um, uh, the sinless of the Pope. Um, and uh, so it means that uh, the Pope is believed to be to have no sins, and that is a kind of postulate uh, which cannot be argued, uh, which is in Russian uh, Orthodox faith is different. We can synthesize uh, the ideas of freedom and love and to understand the meanings which uh, are behind uh, this idea. We will go to, or we will, uh, we will look at the dogmatic uh, attitude of uh, uh, orthodox faith. So we have got the Trinity, and we have got the secret, or the secret of Trinity. And if we think about some uh, common commonplace analogs of uh, uh, Trinity, we can find uh, the Trinity in everything, and. Uh, Two, two natures, the human and uh, the supreme. Um, so and uh, so that, that's the difference and uh, the difference and unity. And we also can look at Grigory Palama, who studies the essence and energy. We uh, have got this unknown essence and endless energy which can let us come into contact with uh, the with the deity or with the uh, with the su supreme reality 
So, and it can interact with us. And doing so, it, uh, it supports the idea of uh, unity. So, and you can see Andrei Rublov's Trinity. And Pavel Florensky says that if there is the Trinity, the, if there is Rublov's Trinity, uh, it's the um, well, it's the sign that there is God. So, uh, Sabornost in Russia, Homikov and Kiryevsky uh, spoke about uh, Sabornost or collegiality. Uh, Homikov is more about communal, uh, uh, well, it's uh, more about communal hermits. Uh, and Kirievsky, Kirievsky is about hermit style of life. And uh, so then subordinate. When we try to translate it into different languages, we'll have a, an absolutely different meaning than so it has an absolutely absolutely different absolutely different uh, meaning uh, rather than what is accepted in the russian in in russian so if if we try to if we try to uh, translate subordinate so that is togetherness or assembliness yeah so or council or assemblage but it's absolutely different and we ha we can identify we can identify some frames of uh, some 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 frames of subordinate. So that is the uh, the faculty of uh, church, and these are some supreme qualities. And subordinate by Homekov is an ideal entity. And it is difficult to achieve because it uh, it comprises uh, both freedom and uh, unity, and also it's the harmony between the individual and uh, communal. And uh, we do not find any justifications to violence or um, or freedom. And this. Uh, Notion. This concept has was addressed by some other Russian philosophers like Aksakov, who uh, speaks uh, about communal principles. Fyodorov, uh, Berdyaev, Ivanov, Frank, mm -hmm. Frank, who was called one of the major researchers who contributed a lot to, under, to the, the understanding of subor, subordinate, then Haruji, Girinok, and, and Natalia Rostova. Then, in spite of such a variety of opinions and interpretations, we will keep in mind uh, the project on sabor on subordinate by uh, Andrei Smirnov. So he studies uh, subordinate outside uh, Orthodox faith, Orthodox religion, and he juxt juxtaposes uh, the mm, the human and the religious. So he studies the Western uni universal logic and, well, like shared human logic. Uh, says that this uh, predetermined standard excludes some people who do not match it. And global logic is the uh, communal lo logic or, uh, well, collegial lo logic, which means that um, it's, well, just it's all subjectivity, so which is understood as uh, subordinate. Uh, this all subjectivity or all um, 
focuses on every opinion and the value of every opinion and every uh, well every point of view and if we lose at least one opinion then it means that the truth will cease to be the whole to be whole so then there are some similarities between uh, russian and western uh, researches that is new universal studies which uh, are suggested by Hester so that is uh, kinship by Haraway that is transparency of uh, borders by Morton and uh, confusion or mm, this mix by Braidotti and new universal theory focuses on new, new universal studies from from uh, from upside down from the grassroots and so then uh, different groups of population can be included into the studies and uh, so not only white uh, white uh, middle-aged uh, men yeah, but some, some other groups of population. Another minus of this concept is that it proceeds from the fact that there is some rationality, unifying rationality. Uh, another concept or approach, which we can find uh, in Haraway, is the notion of kinness. Haraway, first of all, it's that's post and uh, and philosophical view. So, uh, according to Haraway, it's not only kinness, it's not only about people or human beings. So, kinness is possible between different beings. And she also says that there is no being uh, outside the relationship. So, she is saying about this amalgama, so without any relationship, there is no selfness. So, we, uh, and uh, this principle is uh, looks like an ideal. So, what can it result in? So, in Russia, uh, collegiality is based on love. And here, we have some kind of difference. So, if we speak about penetrability of borders, uh, makes this being some kind of evolutionary. So, about the uh, mixing, it's about the human being becoming a machine, an animal, and soil. So, the environment influences the human being and vice versa. So, we conclude that uh, the strong points of Russian project of collegiality is that here we can question the necessity to uh, deny by near position and at the same time, collegiality doesn't say about primarily of unity. It denies un uh, universalism, uh, which is aimed at excluding. And here uh, we idealize uh, personal, individual, uh, uh, and Instead of dependence, we open the prospect of love instead of mixing, and uh, we propose acceptance of difference. There is also synth synthesis of freedom and unity, and the notion of collegiality uh, describes, uh, gives the new understanding uh, which provides dialogue between Russian and other cultures. So here you can see some uh, literature and I would like to thank you for your attention.
So the next speaker is Anna Kartashova. Good afternoon, esteemed jury, participants of the Olympiad. I would like to thank the organizers for an opportunity to take part in such an interesting event and to visit Kaliningrad and to speak at this special place. For uh, participating in the in this stage of the Olympiad, I choose a project which is within. Uh, the topic modern neurophilosophy and problem of artificial intelligence. So, and uh, I am a student of uh, the four years, fourth year student of the Moscow Pedagogical State University at the Department of Philosophy. And uh, my presentation is aimed at uh, audience listening lectures. So, conscious is the main subject for studying by science and studying of mechanisms of conscious uh, is priority. Understanding of these mechanisms can influence understanding of human being uh, of the uh, uh, surrounding world and human being itself. So philosophy and some neuro uh, and, and, some, and some other sciences cannot answer the question what uh, conscious is. In this connection, it's very topical to uh, recall a uh, Nobel laureate, uh, James Watson, who said that uh, the brain is the last and the most important fr frontier, which is the most complicated of all those things which we have discovered in the universe. And uh, that I believe that is why we have to make this topic popular among many people. And we, su we suggest starting a new project, which is called NeuroStorm Ideas, uh, Senses, and Technologies. So this, this project will be interesting for those who uh, are interested in neurophilosophy. And probably it will attract other people who would like to work in this field. This project will will deal with problems of modern neurophilosophy, uh, artificial intelligence, the main topics, the problems and achievements in this field, and the prospects of development. At the same time, this project consists of several modules. Uh, there might be uh, uh, there. There is multimedia exhibition, a series of lectures, and uh, creating a website. The target audience of this project is thus uh, the very wide people who are experts in these fields, uh, with, as well as those. Who who don't know anything about this topic will find something interesting. Uh, this project will help to att attract or involve uh, school children and uh, all those who like it. So the main objective of this project is to uh, popularize this topic, connect uh, everything connected with the brain and, the and artificial intelligence. It's planned uh, that the implementation period of this project uh, will uh, the implementation of this project will take two months. I will speak in particular about each model of the project. So, multimedia exhibition, the ancient uh, logo. Uh, know yourself is very important here. It will be at the entrance uh, to the exhibition as it was in the uh, Delphi temple in Athens. Uh, it is location at the, at the exit into the exhibition will uh, help the visitors to start thinking about such questions about uh, as uh, questions about oneself about the uh, uh, surrounding world 
uh, in spite of the fact that we have studied our brain at different levels, it is still unknown how new neuron processes uh, in the brain uh, form our uh, creation, our emotions, etc. In order to demonstrate this idea, we will show X-raying of different parts of brain. We can see interaction within our brain, uh, within our brain, but we don't see any ideas or thoughts on this in these pictures. Within the exhibition, it's planned to show different exhibits connected with uh, the structure of the brain, different screens which will sh which will visualize inner processes of the brain activity, and different holograms which will also visualize the brain activity with the help of computer video graphics. We would also like to demonstrate different exhibits which will show the level of development of artificial in uh, intelligence as for today. For example, this will be different achievements in roboto techniques. We will show the fundamental difference between artificial intelligence and human being, and we will show the principal impossibility. Uh, will show the impossibility of establishing something new by modern systems of artificial intelligence. In this connection, uh, we will also uh, reproduce the Chinese room by John Sherman. It will be a kind of performance. The uh, idea of, of, of this experiment is that synthesis does not uh, b uh, de develop into semantics. So, Every visitor will be able to feel once uh, to fail as a machine, will be able to get some questions in an unknown language, and will try to uh, answer these questions in in these unknown language using different instructions. And here I would like to emphasize that instruction is not a dictionary. This is a set of implicative uh, ideas. So. After this experiment, the visitor, the visitor can ask uh, himself if he was under, if he understood what was asked and if his answer was understood. So, and the question, as I said, the next module is a set of. Uh, uh, scientific lectures. There will be five lectures. You can see them in this. Uh, Screen that will speak in detail about each of these lectures. The first lecture is uh, on philosophic and uh, um, on our understanding of our mind from the philosophical and natural uh, sciences point of view. So we will speak about the uh, current con concepts of philosophy and neurosciences. We will uh, study uh, the concept uh, mind uh, and consciousness, and we will speak about the challenges uh, which uh, all our research face so these are the uh, con uh, these are the challenges uh, of understanding what our consciousness uh, is and how we can study it from uh, inside and from the outside because our consciousness and our mind does not have any tangible characteristics as such as weight and uh, mm, uh, weight and uh, and and pressure and and mind uh, um, and so but we have have to answer the questions, uh, so what it is like and how it is correl it correlates to the brain and how it can be studied. And then we proceed to the next lecture, and the next lecture is about neurophilosophy and uh, interdisciplinary um, research uh, of mind and brain. And we will study the uh, what neurophilosophy is. We will uh, speak about the connection between uh, mind and uh, and brain, and and we will speak about the uh, well a, a single or unified theory of brain. So at the same time. Uh, we will speak about the processes and the structure of brain and how they are connected because neurosciences discuss the idea of uh, how brain processes can be understood 
as computational processes and can be interpreted as computation. And the idea of uh, thinking as computation can be um, found in Thomas Hobbes when he writes that, uh, well, uh, that speculation is the same as calculation. And while we are speculating about something, it means that we are calculating some concepts and ideas. Uh, we also will speak about the uh, experimental data, which we um, can process today, but at the same time, we do not have a single unified theory of brain, and uh, very often uh, this, uh, um, w very often the, uh, well, some uh, sporadic uh, concept and theories are not connected with each other. So uh, we know that many countries have their own national programs on brain research and they have very high status and a part of being purely medical programs. They uh, also focus on uh, studying the fundamental principles of brain work and at the same at the, uh, uh, at the application of uh, these uh, findings uh, to creating artificial intellect uh, intelligence sorry uh, so because when we create when we think about creating artificial intelligence we uh, make a, an attempt to understand our brain structure better and to understand the principles of brain work better and then we proceed to the third lecture and the this third lecture is devoted to artificial intelligence, and it is named What is Artificial Intelligence? And we will discuss the concept which was introduced by John McCarthy, uh, according to which artificial intelligence is engineering and mathematical science, which uh, dwells with uh, upon the programs or software and gadgets, which imitate cognitive or intellectual functions of a human, uh, which uh, are connected to the decision-making process. Then uh, we will also speak about different um, different uh, kinds of artificial intelligence, like weak artificial or uh, artificial narrow intelligence, uh, which is very applicable, very practical, practical, but uh, rather simple type of artificial intelligence. The next type is the artificial ge general intelligence, and that is the system which can reproduce uh, the whole spectrum of cognitive abilities, or co human cognitive abilities. So it, this system can do everything that humans can do. And so far, this uh, type of in, uh, intelligence has not been created yet. And then artificial superintelligence, so that uh, that supersedes uh, the human capacities in all cognitive tasks. And according to some uh, futurologists uh, and uh, Nick Bo Bostrom in particular, uh, such type of artificial intelligence can be created in the future. Then uh, the lecture will also focus on the history of uh, technology, technological development from first computers um, up to the present day uh, neural networks. Uh, which focus on learning, on machine learning. Then we will also speak about the challenges in artificial intelligence, and we will also say that uh, the systems of artificial intelligence do not have the capacities to understand and to realize. So in reality, artificial intelligence does not have this uh, subjectivity. It does not have this uh, uh, inner uh, ego, uh, ego, and unfortunately, uh, they do not have the system of values. And then uh, comes the question, what system of values can be specif specific to artificial intelligence? And we proceed to the fourth lecture of the cycle. Um, so, and that is uh, the lecture on ethic problems of uh, artificial intelligence application. Uh, there are lots of uh, problems, lots of issues, and they are connected to uh, 
to wide application of uh, AI technologies. Uh, they are applied in all spheres of our life, like medical, um, well, m medical, uh, governmental, uh, well, just whatever sphere you can think about. So, and the first challenge that arises is the privacy challenge. And so, because we, uh, well, just we exist in this world and we leave lots of uh, uh, data and how we can handle this data, this big data. Then, uh, what, uh, who this uh, uh, AI, uh, who uh, this AI uh, system has to account? Uh, so that's the issue of accountability, and then the free will. And the final lecture is going to be on synthesis and some uh, prospects of further uh, further prospects of uh, uh, IT research, and we will speak. Uh, about convergence of uh, neuro, uh, neuro technologies and uh, computer technologies, and that will give us the breakthrough into the future uh, f future computational technologies. Um, so far, brain has been the best technological instrument, technological gadget. And of course, uh, so we think that our fu future uh, I, uh, AI systems must uh, be based on biological principles, the ones which, um, which uh, simulate uh, the brain capacities and brain, brain development principles. So then these are biological technologies which uh, let the human uh, um, manipulate uh, some particular gadgets. Yeah, so then we will also speak about the technologies of MBIX con convergence, and uh, that's about convergence of different uh, fields of knowledge, and it will make it possible to uh, make a well, qualitative breakthrough, and so that's a lot of work, and it is really multimodal, and it is uh, interdisciplinary, and we are thinking about uh, setting up a site, a computer site, and uh, this, uh, well, just the site will uh, include everything that has been mentioned um, in the project, um, so, and uh, so it will also um, we will also upload the lectures, and those people who cannot take part, who cannot see the lecture, who cannot be uh, at the lecture, can um, well uh, 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 can send their questions and uh, uh, questions to the speakers, and they will have their feedback. And also, it has got the chat, where people can communicate and share their um, well their questions and thoughts. Then there will be the dictionary, so which uh, will give uh, the definitions of the major concepts in neurosciences and AI technologies. And to conclude, uh, I would like again to mention that in spite of all the achievements of cognitive sciences, we lack clear understanding of what artificial intelligence is like, and many AI uh, models are, are built uh, or are based on uh, the natural intelligence. And uh, so a good question is, what are we going to create? Because one of the major issues, so Anna, so you are very much behind your time. So that's your final slide. And as David Chalmers said, the mind creates the uh, or asks us the most difficult problems, uh, qu questions. Uh, there is nothing uh, that we know better than mind, and there is nothing that we know less than mind. And uh, the quote which I started my presentation with is, learn yourself. So I think that it's the most topical issue for today. Thank you for your presentation. So the next speaker is Tan Sin Chen. Esteemed jury and participants, the topic of my report is 
philosophy and theology, history and modernity. I would like to thank Charles Taylor, first of all, because my ideas are based on his two books, The Origins and Modern Catholicism, and I'm very grateful to him for that. About 400 years ago, great Jesuit missionary Matteo Ricci came to China and he saw absolutely new world, absolutely new civilization. 400 years have passed after Matteo Ricci came to, to China and now we, we uh, can see uh, the world which does not differ much from the world which Materisha saw. So, here we have the question, why only Materisha was so successful in achieving some results? This is an important question, and it helps us it helps us not only to understand Materisha and his missionary activity, but also it helps to understand how the modern world which we can see today. I'm talking here about the world of China, what Matteo Ricci saw 400 years ago, uh, different from the world today. I first of all would like to say that the, the that Chinese civilization or Chinese world is absolutely different from Christian culture or Christian world. The Chinese world for Matteo Ricci was absolutely different. Un it was not understandable, and that was quite difficult for him to understand. Uh, if the civilization was based on some knowledge and Christian uh, doctrine, then the question is how can this doctrine uh, be given to new audience? So, how it is possible? How, how how is it possible to convey the idea of Christianity of the Bible to some civilizations which do not know that? So, Matteo Ricci acted in a different way than his predecessors. He didn't try to preach the Bible. Uh, from uh, the tutoring position, but he started doing some enlightening work through science and education of Chinese without making them uh, feeling uh, aliens there. And uh, he realized that the image of a monk within local intelligence is not connected with education, but connected with uh, uh, roaming. That's why Matteo Ricci changed his clothes for Confucian uh, pilgrim. He promoted Catholicism and uh, borrowed some traditional concepts of Conf uh, Con Confucian ethics uh, and it was very important for him to get some acknowledgement or recognition uh, from Chinese elite. So. He got in contact with, he, he was the first who, European who came into the closed city or prohibited city. So Matteo Ricci was the first, was the first who learned about mapping, astronomy, and some other things. In 1602, Matteo Ricci published the first Chinese geographical map. Uh, which, uh, due to which uh, the, uh, the Chinese could learn about the new world. Uh, Cooperating with Confu Confucians, uh, he translated into Chinese. He translated uh, some ancient authors into Chinese, and 
he also translated from Chinese, uh, some Chinese classic, uh, classical works into Latin. It's believed that the first Chinese European dictionaries were made by Matteo Ricci. It's believed that uh, Matteo Ricci, together with, with his colleague Michele, uh, made the first Portuguese Chinese dictionary and they developed a certain system of transcription of Ch for Chinese words. Here we uh, must recognize, uh, recognize that embodies of Materici, its impact in the uh, development of the cultural co cooperation or interaction is much more than his missionary activity. According to Taylor Charles, the word Catholic has two meanings, universality and holiness, wholeness. Uh, Redemption uh, is carried out through uh, embodiment, and the life of God is intertwined with uh, human life. And these two human lives are different. Uh, the unity can be achieved only by these two different. Uh, as a, uh, uh, these, these two things can only uh, mutually supplement each other, uh, but we can say that this uh, identification and uh, uh, so this is is a kind is a part of our um, wholeness and our unity. So one of our um, mm, temptation uh, throughout the whole history is the temptation to forget about uh, 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 wholeness and uh, so the need to go to identity and uh, so this uh, wholeness uh, is achieved by the wholeness with the God and the wholeness is achieved uh, by disguising the parts uh, in the wholeness, in the whole. And then universality without wholeness is not the pure, the pure Catholicism. So this uh, unity uh, through uh, differences or through contradiction, it's not only the variety, it's not only the diversity, uh, it's, uh, it's it's not only the material of a human, but it is the material uh, the life of God is made of. And so it means this wholeness through diversity, uh, the second best uh, way to reach the unity. And what is more important, the life of uh, God as the life of Trinity is the diversity and is the, uh, well, the v variety and the diversity of human life. What can we see here? What, can, what did Matteo Ricci did? So I think that what he did 400 years ago is uh, he he proved that uh, wholeness through diversity. Uh, well, he, and so of course I do not uh, um, reject uh, or I do not argue that contemporary world is very different from what Matteo Ricci saw, and. Uh, of course, well, uh, despite uh, the development of society and communication, we still have to understand our world through wholeness, and we still have to find the, cum uh, the common language. And it's not only about the cognitive abilities, it's about the human, and it's about the human and uh, our relation to the uh, environment. and. Our attitude to world uh, has not changed very much, and today we see conflicts of ideologies, and we see the complacency and indifference to the uh, well out to the world around us. We cannot solve the problems only through theology, but uh, well, and we sometimes we do not want to speak about the problems. So probably uh, that testifies to the to the illnesses of our time. 
How can we solve these uh, issues? Or what do we have to do to at least try uh, to solve these issues? So I think that our major remedy is uh, philosophy and religion. And uh, in my view, the in current world, the functions of philosophy and religion are the, f the functions of religion and philosophy are that they must make, they must become a bridge to uh, well just they they must bridge the gap between different worlds and it's only philosophy that can make our uh, world continual and uh, so only philosophy can help us to find some common grounds and philosophy and religion uh, always change the world. The world before Jesus and after him uh, were two different worlds. The world before Descartes and Kant and our uh, understanding of world are absolutely different than in some different times. All people always want to change the world through revolutions and wars, but we must pay with our blood for that. And how can we change the world without any blood? It, uh, we can change it through our mind and thinking. The philosophy after the 18th century uh, goes through the crisis of philosophy. And it's not the uh, queen of all sciences. And the philosophy, uh, there, is, there is a huge question about what, uh, what value of philosophy, what value does philosophy have in the current world? So uh, it means that philosophy does not have to compete with some other sciences, but it has to be acknowledged as the central science uh, about the humans. And so it must deal with the issues of uh, the person and society, the, uh, the issues of ideology and issues of ethics. And this uh, question, these issues cannot be solved without philosophy. Uh, secondly, uh, current philosophy is a healer and its um, task is to diagnose and, and after God's death uh, we will see the death of, a, of hum, humanity and that is why the current philosophy must diagnose our, our time and give it some treatment to diagnose this time uh, Nietzsche uh, well identified uh, the poison for the uh, for our age, and uh, well today philosophy takes this poison to diagnose the illnesses of our time. Michel Foucault also uh, considered that uh, the concept. Uh, well, con contemporary, uh, con contemporality is the, t the attitude. And uh, so he asked us to uh, take, to apply some critical thinking to philosophy. Then uh, thirdly, Certainly, philosophy is, as is media communication. It helps us understand what we are, and it le le makes us go further. Uh, if we uh, speak that we have got uh, well endless space in uh, well uh, in front of us, we have to understand it, and uh, this. Uh, learning and uh, knowledge includes the knowledge of ourselves, and it is uh, equally important to understand ourselves uh, while we are trying to understand the world around us. So the uh, the problems which are connected to the people, uh, these are the problems of sensitivity, problems of uh, freedom and uh, pre predisposition, the problem of the human and uh, their mind. Yeah, so self-identification. The philosophy has its own attitude to absolute thinking uh, and transcendentality, not only for the Christianity, but for many other religions. It's the same as Buddhism. Yeah, f the fundamental idea uh, well penetrated these r different religions with one unique meaning. Yeah, one of uh, the uh, ways to understand it uh, is that uh, the life goes on uh, after death. Uh, life is the well follow-up, and our life does not finish with our death. 
And then we have to understand where the art is, because art is the uh, fight on death, and religion is the attitude to death. And the extended life uh, in Nietzsche's understanding uh, is, uh, mm, well, uh, mm, supersedes the life. And in this uh, meaning, in this idea, it does not differ very much from the concepts of uh, extended life in other religions, such as eternal life, and it has certain similarity to that. So, and... Uh, uh, so people are always inclined uh, to some violence and some uh, uh, <coughs> the one who recognizes transcendentality and if it's not uh, satisfactory, uh, then this moment can mean that the only way to avoid uh, proneness to silence that turn to transcendental uh, transcendentality uh, through love and something good beyond one's life. We could uh, try to consider the great way from the first steps of Maria Ricci to our days. Uh, is this road over? I believe that it is. The task which is before our eyes is very difficult and serious. And only philosophy and religion can give us a clue to solving these problems. Uh, to be the place uh, where love is, this is the place where we should be. Saint Augustine, in his book about the Trinity, wrote, Thus, there are three of us, uh, the one who loves and uh, the one that is loved and love itself. Only through love we can talk about uh, everything and perceive ourselves and the world. In conclusion, I would like to uh, quote Charles uh, Taylor. Uh, Charles Taylor. Uh, probably uh, it's not a coincidence that history of the 20th century could be considered through the prism of progress uh, and uh, through the prism of increasing. Uh, Terror. Uh, 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 probably it's not a coincidence that uh, this is the century where we had um, Aswensem and Hiroshima and uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders. Like Matteo Ricci, the gospel which should be delivered or conveyed to this century and the community which. Uh, which reflect to what is given in the uh, God's life. Uh, so thank, let's hope that this, this time we will manage to do that. Thank you for your attention. Colleagues, now we have the, our next speaker, uh, Vadim Obok, Obokov. Good evening, esteemed jury participants. I'm a student of Belarusian State University. The topic which I have, to have which I chose, this is a Russian philosophy, intellectual culture. In particular, I will consider the theory of cultural univer universalia uh, by stepping and its practical application for defining national men mentality and the development of society in the future. Philosophy, uh, philosophy in general is a theoretical form of organization of intellectual and cultural activity of people which is aimed at uh, understanding the essence and reason uh, of uh, the being itself and existence of a human being. Uh, it, Martin Heidegger mentioned this as an instrument which helps a human being to feel home, so to say, at home.
Actually, traditions of Russian philosoph uh, philosophical culture is connected with uh, understanding of essence, of social existence uh, in all uh, its uh, applications, its uh, qualities uh, and uh, uh, manifestations. Uh, the main uh, pr motive of this philosophy is what we can call pan morality, which is a kind of attribute of Russian national mentality. Nikolai Lossky noted that even working in the fields of philosophy which are far from ethics, uh, Russian philosophers, as rule, did not uh, lose from their sight the connection between the subject and sorry, during the all the, the entire history of Russian philosophy, uh, there is the main topic, uh, this is identification of, of Western Slavics in the world history. This is philosophy with this concept of Moscow as the third world. Vladimir Solovyov, Chadaev, uh, this cosmism, Euro-Asian essence. Ethical problematics is connected with um, social unity and ethnical mentality in particular. In, in general, men mentality is a way of thinking, uh, world vision. Uh, we believe that mentality is a psychosocial structure of the world, of the subject, of the living world of the subject, which uh, determines his reactions. National mentality is an instrument for reactions of the society which helps social collective not to be just people, but to identify oneself as a unique phenomenon in world history for mentality. Uh, it's, it's typical of mentality, the presence of uh, opposing meanings. Vladimir Bershinkin, in his article, which is devoted to the phenomenon of Russian spirit, considered this problem through the prism of fairy tales, uh, some historical work, and he mentioned the prevalence of irrational over national. For example, uh, Ivan the Fool, the Russian uh, fairy tale hero, is, stay, is lying uh, in his house for 30 years, but then he makes some de some labors, at, etc. The same about Kutuzov in War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy at Borodino Battle is waiting for some actions uh, from Napoleon's actions, but Kutuzov is just anticipating. If we take some uh, historical examples, then this is the election campaign of Boris, Boris Yeltsin in 1990, where the main uh, slogan was vote with your heart, where irrational prevailed over uh, mind. So they called for voting with your heart, with your emotions. Scientific approach to study mental structures presupposes finding some typical uh, visions of social ideal, the ideal which has developed by Organization of the system of public ideal is nothing more than understanding of the subsume, the ways of its historical development. The most important elements are the vision of uh, beauty, uh, time, and some other moral uh, things. Cultural universalia, these are categories which accumulate historically, uh, accumulate uh, gathered experience in the system of which helps a person to assess the world, uh, which accumulates all the phenomena of the reality which, is, which are within uh, one's own experience. And it presupposes uh, the further development of the human being. Then culture, it's a complicated system of developing over uh, 
uh, non-biological programs, programs of uh, human activity. This is a system of social ways of existence which are elaborated by mental structures. Human existence starts um, from transition from natural programs of adaptation to use uh, social, cultural, and technological forms of existence. What, ha- what provides existence for human being is the space of its uh, culture. Culture, in this case, in this sense, is a technology of conscious uh, understanding uh, co- or reproduction of the re- of the reality. The forms of activity which prevent human being from existence are suppressed, ignored, but at the same time they don't disappear at all together. They are preserved uh, in the margins. Uh, uh, so, so that in other historical epoch, and uh, under other circumstances, they were rethought and probably even used by the society in a way. <laughs> Stepan said that cultural universalis and philosophical categories can be determined by the same terms, for example, like being, uh, beauty, truth, good. However, for philosophical categories and cultural univers- universalia, their meanings would be different. Philosophical categories cannot convey the entire uh, meaning uh, of this. Being the project of reflection over culture, this mythological mathematical models provide some soil or base for further um, considerations, but they cannot reflect uh, completely individuality, uh, the feelings of the perception by the community, by the society of all these care of these uh, categories are incapable of. The functions of cultural universalia, they uh, select what will be in the uh, flow of cultural translation, then they form categorical structure of public uh, consciousness and they make, they provide the image of the world of certain peoples in certain historical epoch and certain culture. So what about practical? Um, field. So, in practice, we can find some cultural new cellia, as Socrates, who asked to passers-by with the question what justice or fairness justice wa- was. So, um, passers-by can start talking some stories from their life. And here we have the vision of these uh, universals will hardly correspond to philosophical understanding of uh, these uh, things. But at the same time, as it was noted by uh, Vyacheslav Stopin, philosophical universals open new way for development of uh, public culture. They can be alien to uh, their own time, but at the same time, they can give some positive. Uh, they can give some positive start for some new idea, and uh, so that that will develop in the future. Philosophy is uh, the science on. Uh, possible uh, on just uh, possible uh, areas of human activity, uh, not the ones which have already been implemented, but something that can arise in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So you are perfectly in time, and uh, probably there are some questions. If there are some questions to the speaker, so you're welcome to ask. So. But if there are no questions, uh, thank you. And we are going to give the floor to Jana Matskevich. Спасибо. Пожалуйста. 
Good afternoon, distinguished uh, members of the jury and participants. I am Jana Matskevich, and I'm a student of Omsk State, uh, Dostoevsky's Omsk State, State University, and I'm a third year student. And uh, for my presentation today, I have chosen the topic ethics in the digital reality. And my subtopic is the uh, augmented reality in our uh, current uh, context. And uh, so my first uh, topic that I would like to address uh, is meta uh, meta. Uh, meta Meta universe and meta universe is uh, not, of course, uh, our augmented reality, but certainly is its development means that uh, it can affect all aspects of our life, entertainment, and regular work, and well, the, like everyday life. Yeah. So, but at the same time, it also poses a lot of threats and risks, uh, like many other ethic uh, challenges. And but these challenges. Uh, can be found in our everyday life. So these are social and economic uh, inequality, uh, cognitive uh, freedom, and uh, control over our mind. Uh, lots of these uh, issues are studied by neuroethics, and this uh, discipline is divided into two su sub uh, subjects, uh, which must um, uh, add to each other. So the first one is our neurolinguistic preferences. And what happens when we make some moral choice? And then the second one is uh, ethics of neurotechnologies. Uh, for example, in my work, I will study the neuro um, augmented reality and how uh, we uh, as users can protect our cognitive abilities and uh, how we can avoid inappropriate um, moral preferences. Uh, neuroethics is connected to the philosophy of mind and the philosophy of mind and cognition is always very interesting and um, but unfortunately, uh, it hasn't been uh, started, studied very deeply, and philosophers and researchers um, understand that uh, mind can be hardly reduced to some specific properties, and uh, it's uh, not always uh, possible to uh, make some uh, deductions and to make some deduct uh, didact or uh, uh, to make some uh, to deduce some particular um, some particular statements. So in 1974, there was a new wave of interest to neurosciences, and they were thinking about, well, or just the, they thought that they were at the brink of uh, this uh, well, this mystery of mind. And uh, Thomas Nagel uh, published uh, an article in 1974, and the article was, tit uh, was titled, uh, what, was it, what is it like to be a bat? And uh, probably, uh, well, the research, researchers studied the uh, mind of a bat, and they were hoping to understand what it was like to be a bat, but Nagel, um, uh, well, stated that it was not possible to understand what it was like to be a bat, even if we study biologically. Uh, well, the well, if we, if we study it biologically, so it wouldn't give us all the instruments to understand what a bat, what a bat thinks about, and this basic qualia. Uh, Qualia are the the, the simplest uh, uh, f facilities or faculties of our mind, and in our contemporary uh, re reality, uh, we uh, know that our technologies uh, help us uh, create some new new uh, way of thinking and. Uh, in this project, I'm trying to analyze all the uh, ethic uh, parameters of augmented reality, and I, I'm trying to, uh, well, 
introduce it to the uh, general public and I am trying to speak which issues we can see uh, when we um, implement augmented reality in our life. Uh, of course, there are lots of benefits. Augmented reality uh, makes it possible to carry out some more detailed uh, research and one of the best benefits uh, of it is that Virtual virtual reality uh, makes it possible to get some sub subjective experience, uh, but uh, the technologies of virtual reality uh, face lots of uh, ethic conflicts and ethic ethical uh, issues because. Uh, uh, the virtual reality asks if uh, our golden rule of morality be applied uh, to the um, well to the virtual or digital characters. So th uh, it means that uh, well, just we have got a question if we can um, or just if there are, there is any moral judgment of our um, actions actions in the virtual reality. So uh, I have got. I have got an example from a song of Jennifer by Jennifer Haley, uh, "The Lower World," and uh, so that is the um, an example from a world uh, where uh, the uh, where the a man. Uh, well, uh, where the man uh, has got some sexual actions with a child in a song or in an augmented reality, and when he is stopped by the police, uh, he argues that it's not a real world, in such a, it's just a virtual world, and he commits no crime because it's uh, just a virtual world. But then it contradicts uh, the uh, basic moral principles which are which were uh, stated by Kant, uh, by Immanuel Kant, and then, uh, so that's a huge issue if we have to follow the uh, moral and ethical maxims when we live in the virtual world, and if our actions uh, contradict uh, actions in uh, augmented reality or in virtual reality contradict the basic moral principles. So does it mean that we can do whatever we want in the virtual world and if our actions contradict the basic moral principles? So does it uh, break the moral law? Because anyway, so no matter where we do it, uh, so we um, when we when we uh, show some behavior that destroys ourselves, distracts ourselves, uh, so it uh, well actually kills the morality. And if we allow ourselves commit some crimes in the virtual world, it means that we will follow the same uh, action or the same pattern of behavior in the real world. Yeah, so in the technologies of artificial intelligence, we have got only pre-programmed. Uh, uh, type of actions and uh, that has been done or that usually is done by the by a human and it means that we somehow control the virtual world but some actions are not uh, so some actions go beyond our moral code and who is responsible for that and in uh, films, we can see some people uh, showing uh, different, mm, uh, well, some inappropriate behavior towards some other people, but we understand that it's just a movie, and people who uh, show it in the movie are actors who may be absolutely different personalities in our real everyday life, yeah, but at the same time, uh, when we uh, see the same in uh, the virtual world, in the computer games, how how do we have to evaluate it? What is the proper evaluation? If uh, the character is uh, the same character as in the real world. Another interesting example. Uh, 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 so creation of a VR helmet. The helmet uh, is connected with the, uh, with the special sensors, and if uh, the participant or play player loses the game, uh, the sensors uh, uh, work as if they destroy the brain completely. The creators uh, say that this VR helmet is created, is unique, and created in one 
Uh, uh, there's only one of the such. So in my presentation, I put some information where the founder of the company said that he uses this uh, technology in different projects, but he uh, did not specify in which ones. So if the, uh, I mean to say, if the virtual helmet does not kill us, uh, there might be something else which can do that. So when we discuss such news, uh, this news, we understand that uh, the boundary between uh, virtual reality and reality is very fragile. And the last example. So this example is about personality. This is reality plus. Uh, so this is the, this is the world which has uh, uh, in virtual technologies. This is me metaverse, and uh, it begins with the main character who wears. Uh, and uh, some device which helps him to uh, recognize people, recognize faces of people. And this uh, character is uh, not a person who can be helped with this uh, device. I believe that this technology can be used for people who have some physical diseases, uh, for example, some sight problems or people suffering from dementia. And in this case, uh, the, uh, the character de uh, so the problem on this book is that this hero loses his device and stops being its himself. Here I would like to say that we are starting being slaves of dig digital technology and according to Kant, again, our duty uh, makes us improve ourselves uh, both in, uh, in different ways and to authorize our uh, in brain with a certain the internet, different gadgets and computer games, due to which we can feel some enhanced reality, are actually some uh, things uh, which uh, obscure reality and technologies of, of uh, are Artificial intelligence gives us a way which is programmed, but we perceive this way as an opportunity to obtain uh, easy knowledge, to Google for to Google for some information. So there is no need to read books to get some education. We can we take this as an opportunity to communicate with other people. So we have all undergone this period of COVID, and we agree that, that uh, when we are at home and communicate with each other through different remote, uh, different devices, then afterwards it's very difficult to get into a real world. We agree upon that. Moreover, technologies of uh, virtual reality uh, take our time from our real life and it takes our cognitive abilities as well and which uh, influences us in a bad way in the future it may cause some problems with which humankind cannot fight so summarizing or coming to conclusion, I would say that augmented reality is advertised as a gate to metaverse, but influence of long-term usage of virtual reality uh, upon our personality is not studied, and it's not studied uh, in terms of ethics, because quite often people are worried only with two parameters. This is some 
something material, so how, how much uh, it costs and how can I uh, get that. And the second one is, is technical. But ethnical problems are even not on the third position. So, I mean to say that there are a lot of ethical problems. Uh, will uh, usage of VR influence our cognitive abilities? Will we remain being people when we hide upon, uh, 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 under masks of virtual reality? And the main question is whether we will lose our personality. These issues remain discussionable, but discussing these issues, we provide uh, ground for the being, uh, for, uh, for the being where will we be in the future. The more we discuss these issues nowadays, the last mistakes we will make in the future. Thank you for your attention. <coughs> Thank you. And uh, so we are happy to give the floor to our uh, last but not the least speaker, Dmitry Fedotov. Yep. So the floor is yours. Well, so I can see my presentation in the screen. And I would like to start uh, with a short introduction. I, I will tell you the story how I came to this issue, to this problem, and why I think it is relevant. Uh, because, uh, of course, there are lots of uh, uh, there is a diversity of philosophical problems which are very topical, but uh, philosophy, uh, well, usually studies the uh, well different processes in our reality, like well, uh, econom econ uh, well economy, politics, religion, war, and I would like to start with uh, um, mentioning that our current situation. Uh, in my opinion, in the opinion of you, uh, very many Eurasian people, is an attempt to complete something that was not done in the past. And I think that uh, Kandyan philosophers, uh, well, we, we, we've, we've spoken a lot about our moral obligation and our uh, unity, but I still think that Eurasians uh, continue the tradition to establish their proper order. Uh, I, I do not want to be very much mainstream, but uh, the figure of uh, Dugin and Eurasians uh, will become the major ones, have become the major ones in our Eurasian philosophy. But I would like to say that the current events uh, open up some uh, long forgotten works and papers that uh, we could read some time ago, but uh, which we could hardly address now. Uh, but I would like to get back to uh, the to Nikolai Trubetskoy, to the count, to count Nikolai Trubetskoy, uh, who is uh, known in the Western world as a founder of uh, formal linguistics. And then it developed into French structuralism, and in the 1960s, it will be uh, de deconstructed by Lacan, Davida, Foucault. But at the same time, according to the words of Leo Strauss, Trubetskoy is to be studied as the uh, figure of Eurasian movement whose understanding came from the dynamics, understanding the dynamics of language, but where the focus was placed on speech rather than uh, writing. 
Eurasian vision of Trubetskoy is special for some particular elements to, well, just to understand what Eurasian uh, thinking is. At least uh, this, uh, this vision uh, was founded before the uh, history of the European of the Soviet Union finished, and uh, so and uh, his thinking uh, or the the key thing for this is his essay, which is called uh, Europe, Russia, and Humanity, uh, and he considered the Russian Revolution to be um, to be enough. Uh, or to be comprehensive enough uh, to uh, break up with uh, national uh, nationalist movement, and at the same time he uh, underestimated uh, the well longevity of the Soviet Union. But what he didn't like in Europe as the uh, as uh, the idea is similar to what Eurasians don't like today. At the same time, he was uh, an opponent of communists, and he said that European liberalism is the imperialist ideology, which is disguised by uh, cosmopolitan uh, philosophy. And the difference between Eurasia or the uh, something that differentiates Eurasia is, uh, well, just the idea which pushed millions of people under, uh, under the tanks in the First and Second World War. At the same time, he uh, supported the idea of Woodrow Wilson uh, when he spoke about uh, the split of great empires of uh, Eurasia into uh, a number of uh, national states. And Trubitskoy said that when, when or when we speak about denazification de as one of the major aims of special operation, uh, so he says that uh, mm, uh, the idea of Ukraine uh, to become the national state is uh, the idea uh, that is. Uh, that idea that is facilitated by the uh, nationalist ideas of the First World War. Um. And another thing uh, that corresponds to Trubetskoy's vision is uh, that he was a leading phonologist uh, of the 20th century, and he was very sensitive to uh, the sounds of speech. And unlike Leo Strauss, who uh, was very much focused on the um, on writing and reading. Trubetskoy and other uh, ph uh, phonetic uh, phonology uh, researchers thought that the speech is the unification element for um, the for ethnic groups. And he formulated the principles of a Russian uh, cultural studies. And uh, so he said that the links between different parts of the nation can be broken, but it's, uh, it does not apply to the links between uh, the uh, language and land. So, and uh, since the middle of the 20th century, uh, the ideas of Trubetskoy have been revised. But uh, Trubetskoy uh, comes forward with quite a provocative thought that we have to look at we we have to look at the Mongol uh, Empire as a good example of the warrior and as a good example of um, the uh, well just a good example of ethnicity. Actually, Trubetskoy uh, believed that um, <clears throat> deep phonological history enables people speaking the same languages from different parts of the world hear uh, the past, the present, and the future. Probably, uh, this uh, provides some platform for the sense of unity. Uh, we spoke today about collegiality. So, from this point of view, there is a great difference between the people who live in different phonological regions, uh, which is desirable, according to Trubetskoy, to 
substitute the national phonological system with the other. So the first one was considered by Trubitskoya as poetry, and the second one as uh, conquest. And that that was different from popular ideas of those times because it presupposed probably inevitability of conquest. Uh, that's why foreigners will uh, take the locals outside, will drive the locals outside. So for Trubitsko, it looked like modern European expansionism. Now, uh, uh, the current version of Euro-Asianism emphasizes the priority of land over uh, language as a uniting principle for different peoples. Probably uh, this influence, this is influence of Chinese or Khan uh, version of the unity of land and blood. But I believe, still, I believe that Trubitsko is quite an intrigue figure in the light of in light of protecting of the Russian language and uh, Pushkin uh, uh, works in both countries. So that's what I wanted to say. So we have some time. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can ask them to Dmitry. So there are no questions. Thank you very much, Dan. Dear friends, so we have worked quite well. We have heard 15 presentations which were difficult, different according to their genre, according to their objectives. And I would like to comment on them very much to praise someone, to single out someone, to share my views upon it. But I have no right to do that as a as the uh, chairperson in this jury. I will abstain uh, because we have other members of, of of the jury, and we will discuss all these issues tomorrow. And tomorrow at three o'clock, you will know the result. Please don't forget that we have another group which. Uh, was working, and there is another one more group which made written works. And the winners and the uh, those who will get some prizes will be quite big. I I want there will be some winners in our group and probably the winners of this Olympiad. So uh, I'd like to thank you on this, and now we are going to have dinner. <laughs>